reconvene this meeting of the Board of Regents. Uh, we've had our faculty breakfast, very productive conversation. Thank everyone for being there. Um, and we are ready to move to the strategic plan on our agenda. Commissioner Stearns. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we talked about in our last meeting, that we would work with the campuses and begin to flex our muscles, if you will, in terms of our ability to measure the outcomes that you have put into your strategic plan and to bring examples of those that connect to your strategic directions and objectives and to kind of test them with, with campuses and thereby improve them and make sure we all remember them. Last time, we focused on the particular dashboard and indicator of college participation. college participation. And um, obviously, you see standing before you ready to roll, Associate Commissioner Tyler Trevor. And before uh, Tyler starts with that, I, I'll tell you, it is, has been quite a, a process for us to you know, dig in, test them with the campuses, and find anomalies or problems as a result of, you know, testing it a little further for this big public presentation. Um, I will also acknowledge that the last time Regent Hamilton asked us if, even if we don't do it immediately, if fairly fast we could, I mean, I, I think you'd like it prefatory to when you get it, but as, as we get better at this, to a, like a paragraph or a one-page narrative that, okay, so you've got this data, what does it mean? What, what does it tell you? What trends is it indicating or improve, you know, directions for improvement, whatever. So the last time Tyler said, I, I don't know, I'm not sure we can do that. And of course went back and about an hour and a half came back and he said, I think I've got it. I think I've got it summarized. So this process is, is not just so, as much a, in value for its results as it is, although that's the main purpose for all of the campuses and us but it is adding to our ability to help you make good decisions. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Trevor. That's, that's a funny thing, but Mr. Trevor, that is his <laughs> name, and the formal direction there, uh, and let him take it away and tell us what he's learned in the last month or so about retention. Mr. Trevor. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Good morning. Um, I guess I'd just start off by saying the sequence of this presentation, we have 45 minutes allotted for it. I'm not going to stand here and talk for even a fraction of that, maybe five to ten minutes, maybe five to ten minute overview of the information, and then it's, then it's yours. You, you're, you're free to ask questions of the data about the specifics or um, to um, the campuses uh, about retention efforts. So. Um, that's completely up to you. Uh, the other uh, caveat, I guess, or uh, caution note, I have to say, is that this is a spreadsheet. It's not that uh, conducive to a, a PowerPoint presentation or um, something that we can all just sit back and look up at the screen. So we're passing around a spreadsheet um, for those in the viewing audience, which I happened to be yesterday. Uh, I apologize uh, for the, the small detail. Um, but this is just one of those real detailed, nitty-gritty um, measurement types of things that, that we're going to have to, to use a spreadsheet like this on. Uh, before we get started, um, uh, taking a look at the data, I, I really wanted to emphasize what Commissioner Stearns uh, mentioned there about uh, this go-around of dashboard indicators being more of a challenge. Um, last time we, just, we, we looked at college participation rates. Uh, honestly, not that hard to pick up how many students come into your institution. Uh, but when you switch that to how many first-time, full-time students come to your institution and return for a second year, you're hitting on the nerve system of the campus. That is their, uh, and I can tell you this from being an institutional researcher, one of their number one institutional measures of success is retention. So, so needless to say, we had everybody's attention with this one. And, um, and to give you an example, many thanks. I, I see uh, Mr. Muse smiling at me. Um, I had conversations with just about every single campus in detail. And I would give thanks to Bill Muse from UM, uh, Jim Rimpaw, MSU, Michael Barber, 
from MSUB, Melissa Harrington, the institutional researcher at Montana Tech, Lindsey Brown, the registrar up at uh, MSU Northern, Jason Karch, the registrar from Western, Joe Schaefer, um, and his staff, and almost behind every one of these is somebody else and their staff, Tony Thomasu, uh, Bill's right-hand man, and uh, Brad Eldridge at Flathead Valley, and honestly, the list goes on. But the value of this, as the Commissioner stated, is not just for us to take a look at information that's generated from our data warehouse by one person that is validated by the campuses, but it engages the campuses in information that you'll be looking at and, and information that they hold dear to their heart. So with that said, um, as you can see, uh, th I, I take pride in this uh, as, as probably um, some of the better information that I've been able to bring forward to the board that it, in fact is generated by the system office, validated by the campus. We have the ability to do this through our warehouse going forward. Um, two, two notes about this data. Um, this is different retention information than you've ever taken a look at before. And the reason why is it doesn't just focus on institution within an institution. It takes into consideration students that transfer. And in the past, what we've always said is 71% oh, of our students came back for a second year. But however, that counted transfer students as dropouts. You know, it's, it's kind of an a, a oxymoron in your mind is how, how in the world can that be? Now, by using the warehouse, we can actually, if you went to MSU Bozeman your first year as a first time full-time student and transferred to UM your second year, you're counted in, in there as a system-wide success. And just to explain how that happens, if you could all take a look at basically the first cell, I have a, a, a laser pointer here, uh, for MSU Bozeman, it says institutional rate of the cohort that came in in fall 2005. It was 71% of the students came back for a second year. 71% of the first time full-time students came back. Well, 75% actually came back overall. That includes the 71% that came back to MSU Bozeman, but also 4% that came back at any other MUS institution. And so it works its way through the presentation like this. And at the very bottom of the presentation, you'll see a system-wide uh, retention rate. Um, and so it's split out by two and four-year campuses. Uh, one other thing I needed to mention is that this is a full picture of two-year education. In the past, you won't see this. Uh, this has UM Western's associate cohort split out. It has Northern's associate cohort split out. We have the community colleges on here, which two out of three of them are now on our warehouse, although these data don't depict that. They will in the future. Um, and for Flathead Valley, we used uh, a, a data exchange, uh, since we have such a close relationship now with the institutional researcher there who used to work for us. Um, very easy uh, to do with Brad Eldridge to track their transfers. The, the, the students that came back at their institution, he did. He gave me their data set and I, I matched it up with the entire MUS data set. So th this is some really good stuff. And uh, not that easy to, to do a, a, a summary of Regent Hamilton, but I took my shot. And so the first couple bullets here I'd go over with you. Um, as Mr. Muse would indicate to me, this won't be called a dashboard unless you have some kind of benchmark to compare it to. So uh, taking that advice, um, we, I, I went back to what's the best we can get for the Western states. Um, and th those rates we get out of IPEDS are institutional rates. So we have to back off the system-wide retention rates here for a second and just compare institutional rates. And at four-year campuses throughout the West, the average institution, the institutional retention rate is 76%. Now, let's compare that to some of the best in our system. Um, for fall 2009, institutional retention rates for MSU and actually UM uh, at 75% and UM at 74%, um, they're right in there in the mix. Uh, we had rates, though, at, uh, for the four-year cohort at MSU Billings as low as 56%. So you can see we have quite a range there. Now, moving on to two-year, the comparison there for the Western states is 60% institutional retention rate. Uh, for fall 2009, we had rates as high as 65% at MSU Northern. Uh, and and uh, I, I'd recommend that you take a look at those rates at Northern because they're, they're pretty impressive for a two-year two cohort. Um, and as low as 40% at, at Montana Tech COT. And just uh, a note that in fall 2008 at Miles, and Dawson, 
Uh, we've seen some pretty high rates as well as western and northern again um, are all above 60%. I'm going to give you a chance here to ask questions, but just a couple more points. Um, so who has been the highest performers over the last five years? Right off the bat, uh, UM Western's data stands out. Their institutional retention rates have increased by 9.6 uh, percentage points. So let's, if we can take a look at, at, at Western. And now, now I'm looking at their overall system-wide retention rates. Um, for the four-year cohort in fall 2005, it was 66%, and by fall 2009, they're 76%. So there's a full-on 10%, 10 percentage point increase um, at Western. And also another thing to point out there, uh, yes? Yeah, M Mr. Chair, I just want to interrupt for just a second. Um, you are, in terms of your summary and analysis, you're on the about the third paragraph. Yep. Campuses that experience the most growth and retention. That's right. Okay, so UM Western, um, I like to make sure everyone got that, paying yeah. attention to it, because it's what we all predicted with the implementation of Experience One. It appears, I don't, I don't know what chance or story would say, but it appears that that is having an effect. I don't know, cause uh, and effect, but. Yeah, and, and I, th I that think that. That is dramatic, is that absolutely. not right? Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely, and cause and effect, I'm not able to comment on nearly as well as Chancellor Story, and I'm, I'm sure he'll probably get a chance here in a moment. Um, uh, interestingly enough, though, too, the, 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 the students that they're getting in in that full-time cohort um, are somewhat mobile as well. They, there's ten, there's a, a, a gap there in between their institutional rate and their system rate um, at times as high as 10 percentage mm -hmm. points, uh, meaning the, the, the students that, that, that they're getting um, are invested in higher ed, whether it be not just at UM, uh, but also uh, uh, to the entire university system. Uh, next on the list, and uh, I'd be remiss, and I saw Daniel Bingham just looking at me that I'd come here and not point out his rates. Uh, and uh, UM Helena, um, I, before running this, I had no clue that this was the case, but their um, rates have increased as much as seven percentage points. Um, Institutional rate went up 6.3%. Their overall system-wide rate, uh, they're one of the, uh, as far as two-year campuses go, their student body transfers to um, other institutions, and we can take a look and see exactly what those institutions are, which I haven't mentioned yet, but behind all this data are complex matrices where you can see exactly how many students went from, let's say, UM Helena to UM to Western to Tech. It's all there. So embedded within this is our transferability data. And then finally, as I mentioned before, MSU Northern's uh, associate cohort, um, uh, uh, that not only are they at high rates, but they've increased quite a bit in the last 10 years. Uh, finally, um, just for comparison purposes here, as I mentioned, we have one-year transfer rates embedded inside of this. The difference between institutional and system is your transfer rate. Um, and uh, Western led the way in fall 2009 with 8.3% of their students. Um, overall, their student body, I believe, was a 76%, came back for a second year, um, and I did that by memory, uh, and, uh, and tech at 6.5%. So, Mr. Chair, with that, I'd stand for any questions uh, directly about the data and defer to the campuses about any of their um, uh, individual details. Thank you, Mr. Trevor. Any questions from Regent McLean? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Tyler, for always doing the great job and the great presentations that you do. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, my first one is, um, do high school students um, who apply for and take dual enrollment uh, credit, uh, credits, um, are they considered part of that respective year's cohort? Mr. Chair, Regent McLean, uh, eventually, when they're taking their dual credit, they are not. Uh, they are not considered first-time students until they matriculate uh, to um, a campus. So uh, when they're in their senior year, they're in another group mm -hmm. called early admits. So they don't influence this until they actually come to the campus. Okay. And then a follow-up. Do we have 
the data now that demonstrates us retention then of any of those students who have taken that on-ramp into higher ed? Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent McLean, uh, yes, we have the ability to calculate of what students out of these cohorts um, enrolled in classes uh, when they were in high school. But I don't know if those classes were dual enrollment courses. Uh, I know if they're dual enrollment, they're of course dual enrollment, but I don't know if they got dual credit for them. I guess that's what I'm saying. So I can tell you if early access students, students who access college earlier than their, than their after their senior year, um, how they fared. I, I could go back and do that. I haven't done that, but uh, we have the ability to do that, yes. Thank you, and then one more, I think. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if we have our retention data broken down by demographics. Mr. Chair, Regent McLean, absolutely. Um, we can break this down by uh, any demographic that we collect in the data warehouse, which is a, a, a huge variety. Okay, thank you. I may be call contacting you to you get bet. some of that. I appreciate uh, your great work. Thank you. Regent Buchanan. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Trevor, <clears throat> kind of following up on that demographic question, uh, this morning we had a very good dialogue with faculty related to defining success rates and whatnot, and um, there was a good case made for the metrics in two-year versus four-year and identifying what types of students might be accessing those institutions. And uh, for example, when I'm, we're describing retention rates to legislators and we mention some of these numbers, they might seem disappointing. You know, we're not in the A category. It was, the case was made this morning that a lot of the two-year students are coming for one or two courses. Uh, so they yep. not, automatically are not coming back. Are we able to identify the intentions of the students that we recognize they may be uh, intentionally enrolling in a program where a certificate is the goal or they're identifying early on that they're saying, I'm here for one or two courses uh, to enhance skills? Mr. Chair, Regent Buchanan, yes. And the first uh, application of that is applied in this. This is looking at only first-time, full-time students. So that gets rid of anybody who just came for one or two classes. They were there for four classes. First so they, they were there with a pretty good intent to do something. Uh, that first semester. <laughs> now, they might have got, they, they, they might have received such uh, uh, specific uh, information, you know, training and breaks for diesels, uh, bam, they got hired. And, and they get lost out of this. But if they received a certificate in that first year, we counted them as a success in this retention data. So it, it, it corrects for some of that, but that is inherent to um, uh, data at a two-year campus and very critical that educational intent is uh, collected on applications of students when they come in. Uh, so you can, uh, and I don't know if it would pick up in a system-wide report like this, but an individual camp campus can say, um, okay, that person said they were here for the primary purpose of transfer. And then you can track those cohorts. So uh, you can see quickly the, the water gets muddied. Uh, but this data right here isn't far from what you just said by, by the mere fact that we're looking at first-time, full-time students. So Go ahead, Regent Buchanan. Just a quick follow-up, the advancement in our ability to demonstrate this is in the, just a couple of years I've been on the board is outstanding. Good work, Tyler, thank you. Mr. Trevor, is, so is, is that how you identify the duly enrolled too, is that they're not first-time, full-time students, or do we actually, do you know who the, the duly enrolled students are? Because they have student ID and... Yep. Mr. Chair, yes, we know by um, your admit code. We give them a different code than if you were a first-time freshman. Okay, thank you. Mr. Story, <laughs> Chancellor Story. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, three quick things. First of all, to thank uh, Tyler and to let him know that when he gets back to his office on his desk, he'll find that bottle of Crown Royal that I promised <laughs> you. <laughs> I knew there was something in there. Yeah. Uh, I look at, at our campuses as a kind of a large ecology problem. And to think of the ecosystem as only growing because of one organism, picking up with Royce's yesterday, is probably not going to really pay off at the end. But certainly experience one has been a huge factor. But just like the other campuses, we've done things in, uh, th that help with retention in terms of learning centers and advising, et cetera. Uh, we've all done these kind of things. We've all had efforts. But experience one is the differentiator, and we, we recognize that. The other sort of factoid I want to pass along, uh, and this is a challenge that I think many of us face, is that a, about 70% of our first year students require developmental math. And of those 
half of them who fail the first time do not come back to school after two semesters. In two semesters, they are gone. Of those who just take developmental math, about 30% do not come back. Um, Mr. Chair, if I, Chancellor Story, would you explain why? You, just delve into that just a little bit more for me, please. Why the, how, how that affects the student, or what, what, it, well, or I, what you could do about it. And that's, that's again kind of an, uh, Commissioner Stearns, that's again kind of an ecosystem question in my mind because I think there's a lot of factors. Students research, and I haven't looked at this in a while, but there was some pretty good research out there that suggested the main reason students dropped out of school uh, was because of lack of academic success. They're more prone to tell you it's because of finances or other kinds of things. They don't really want to tell you, I flunked you know, developmental math twice and so forth, and I'm, it's just not working out. I, I think the answers about why students struggle with math go back to a lot of other kinds of studies like math phobia, uh, people kidding around about I just can't understand math, which has always befuddled me that people do that. There's a number of complex reasons, but I think that the <laughs> students just come to a university expecting whatever they expect, and they end up in a developmental class and maybe even two developmental classes. That doesn't help them with eligibility for athletics. It doesn't help them with financial aid. It actually hurts them. So there's a number of complex factors that go into it. And like the other campuses, we don't do anything any different except we schedule our class a block at a time. Uh, we try to do exit interviews with every student and understand we're still developing the, those data sets, uh, but we want to understand why they leave. We want to, and, and we, we certainly define retention as one of the success indicators, but it's not the only one, as someone indicated. We may have a student come that just really wants to take a couple of blocks, uh, and, that's, and that's what they came to do, and they, they get, they earn the grade they wanted, they complete the class, and they're a success. Thank you, Regent Barrett. Uh, so Trevor, do you have a, a feel or maybe direct knowledge? I'm just, I'm looking at the bottom line, bottom line number, the aggregate four year, 75.1. How does that st stack up nationally? Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Barrett, I can comment on that for our Western states, um, given the fact that uh, the average or aggregate institutional retention rate for the 14 witchy states that we compare ourselves to is 76%. So that's that 76% at those isn't taken in consideration transfer within their system. So you're gonna say, let's add the equivalent increase, so maybe three, four percentage point um, higher. Uh, theirs is gonna be closer to 80%. So we, we're, you know, in essence, lagging behind. Just like we've known we have been, um, when we were just using our institutional rates aggregated up and comparing those to the western states. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? President Ingstrom. Mr. Chairman, Regent Barrett, I can add a little bit to that last question that you just asked. Two years ago, we had set some targets in terms of freshman to sophomore retention through that Partnering for Student Success program, and the target of 80% uh, was selected because that would have that would put us in the top quartile of peer institutions. So that's another comparator point. Thank you, Commissioner Stearns. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question, mainly I guess for um, Dean Bingham. Um, do you think that the uh, increase in your freshman to s sophomore retention rate relates a little bit to the investment in the kind of facilities and programs that you have developed. Frankly, the, the legislature, the executive, and the Board of Regents have invested. I mean, clearly, this is from five years ago, a, a completely different kind of setup, environment. Um, I'm setting you up to say yes, but I guess I would like some elaboration. Sure, Mr. Chair, Commissioner. Uh, there's a combination of things, and facilities certainly is a big, big factor. It has allowed us to go out into the community and uh, market the institution in a very different way, in a very, uh, uh, not, not just in, in a, the mindset of a college of technology. It was allowed us to expand in our general education and transfer. 
it, it gave uh, our community uh, a look into the fact that we're comprehensive in nature and that we're striving to meet the needs of the total community in preparation for a student who wants to go to a four-year college. But coming right out of high school, finances and such may not be able to make that, that leap. We've had lots of students come here who would have not accessed uh, any type of higher education, but because we've expanded that mission through, uh, again, not, not just in the academic area, but the facilities, uh, that, that's a big picture. When you, when you come to an institution, you want to come to a place that looks good. If it looks good, it generally has a feel of quality and all that kind of stuff. We've, we've marketed that very, very heavily. And then we've also put a significant resources into our remedial education programs. And our, and our outreach. So we have programs that if a student appears to be struggling within the first couple weeks of a semester, that student is identified by a faculty member. Faculty member gets with our, uh, our staff. Our staff makes personal phone calls. Uh, we get, reach out, grab that student, bring them in, and find out what we can do to help them to be successful. So it's just a combination of a lot of different things that we have uh, tried to put together as a package deal for retention. Thank you, Dan. Regent Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a comment more than a question, I guess. This is phenomenal. I mean, this is really a sea change kind of a, of a report. And um, I'd just like to congratulate the campuses and Mr. Trevor for the hard work that's gone into making this data really usable by the board. Um, I think, too, and I don't like to pat our own backs, but I'd like to give the board a little credit for this conversation because it's been years in the making that we've actually changed the conversation from the board level, trickled down to the campuses about the importance of student services and the importance of retention and the importance of working with K-12 education to make sure that students are making well informed and that they're pre prepared for the college choices that they're making. So again, congratulations to everyone at this table now and for the past 10 years and to all of our campuses because this really has been a team effort. Thank you. And my Mr. last comment, Mr. Chairman, is that I, I should have mentioned, I know that the three community college presidents have stories to tell as well, good ones, about how the work they're doing on student success and retention. They will be here as soon as they can. There is a bill that specifically relates to the three community colleges that's before the legislature, and they're up at that hearing, and they will be back soon. So I just want to put a shout out on their behalf. And thank you, Regent Hamilton. I mean, the, the board took the lead in developing uh, a very embryonic data warehouse in the late 90s, and over the, the years, it has really, you, you all have invested, and it's really beginning to pay dividends. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, then we will move to the uh, Staff and Compensation Committee uh, meeting. And uh, I, before we start that, we, we've had one sort of, I don't know what we'll call it, issue worthy to uh, comment on, and uh, Commissioner Stearns will do that, and then I believe uh, President Ingstrom is going to make a couple comments as well. Right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I would like to call to your attention press reports um, that we have made you aware of uh, individually, but I think it should be on the record for you as a board that there is a, uh, in terms of accountability issues, uh, a major issue occurred at the University of Montana Missoula campus that that is uh, now been um, is now in the public arena and is being um, treated and as a crime, which it is. There's a, a major embezzlement. And I wanted you as a board to understand from the president and from me as commissioner, I guess, how we handle that. And, and this would particularly for you, I guess, Regent Buchanan as chairman of budget and audit committee. And alleged. good point, alleged. I need to, to use that, alleged in, um, incident. And to give you just a little sense of how the process works when something like this is alleged, is that the president at that time, George Jennison, contacted me last summer. And he said, we have it, what looks like um, an incident, perhaps fairly major embezzlement, fraud, and uh, keeps our office posted. 
And he said, we are immediately notifying the law enforcement authorities. And we also, this is something I don't think all board members know, is that the University of Montana campuses and the MSU campuses are, have within them um, internal audit and that they share with, with not just the, the large campus, home, home, the uh, host campus where the office is, but all the campuses. And so they begin the tedious work to look into that uh, very carefully. And again, you're, as your commissioner, I was kept well informed about that, as I know that law enforcement was, and it's quiet because it needs to be investigated carefully, slowly, thoroughly. So with that, I would just have President Engstrom, I think it's just kind of a teaching moment for all of us as to how we handle this, and then we can go on to other issues of staff and compensation. President Engstrom, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, members of the board, um, so I'll just add a little bit of detail, uh, but um, last summer it did come to uh, the attention of uh, our internal auditor that there was a possible incident involving our residential life area of an employee that uh, was handling cash and may have uh, diverted some of that cash to personal uses. So uh, as the commissioner indicated, as soon as our internal auditor became aware of this, uh, that office did a preliminary investigation and determined that there was enough um, reason to think that something might be going on that we then at that stage immediately called in law enforcement. And so law enforcement has done an investigation, external law enforcement. Um, and as of uh, just yesterday, um, has uh, uh, charged an individual with, uh, with a crime. The dollar amount is in the vicinity of $300,000, and it appears to have happened over a period of, I believe, seven or so years. Teresa, is that right? Um, so it's in the hands of law enforcement at this point. Uh, the person has been uh, taken into custody and uh, will let the legal system play out as it will. So unfortunate incident, and... Uh, We've taken measures uh, on campus to make sure that it can't happen again. Thank you, President Engstrom. Any questions from the board? Okay. Then we'll move on uh, to our information agenda. The uh, first item is the uh, MUS employee group benefits. We have Connie Welsh here to, and it looks like uh, Deputy Commissioner Robinson is joining now. Just there for the appearance. Uh, Mr. Chair, member of the board, I think uh, we're going to turn the presentation over to Connie Welsh, the, uh, our, our director of uh, benefits for the system, and she'll provide a little overview of the information. Thank you. Ms. Welsh. Chairman Christian, members of the Board of Regents, thank you very much. I wanted to provide today a little overview on a couple topics of interest for the Montana University System Benefit Plan. One of those items is to talk about the, uh, the much discussed uh, health care reform and how that may impact the Montana University System Benefits Plan and our system. And then the second item I'd like to provide is just a brief benefit update for uh, the upcoming fiscal years, fiscal year plan, uh, plan year 12 and fiscal year 13. So those two tie together. Uh, I've provided you with a little, just a few bullets and notes, uh, primarily because there's some financial information in there and it's a little easier to make notes in that manner. The Health Care Reform Act, I think, um, I don't know anyone who hasn't picked up a paper or turned on the television and heard some discussion about health care reform. And it's a very, um, a very uh, controversial issue uh, as far as a policy and uh, so those of us who are working in that field and industry are kind of working our way through that as this entire public discussion remains in flux. So let me start out a little bit and tell you how the first involvement for the university system plan began. I began with the uh, university system in June of 2010, and prior to that, I was administrator of the Health Care and Benefits Division for the state of Montana and operated the state employee plan. Paul Bogomil was your director of benefits. We happen to be, we share a consultant. So March 23rd is when the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was signed by the president. We happened to be sitting in my offices that day with our consultant talking about health care reform. 
and trying to get ready for it. So I guess the first message I would tell you is at the time the president was signing the bill, we were planning for the bill. So I don't think you can get a much faster jump on it than that. The bill itself was comprised of two pieces. One was the Primary Affordable Care Act, which was very broad brush legislation. And the second piece was a reconciliation bill that was signed on March 30th. One of the most difficult parts of health care reform implementation is that much of this information was not contained, much of the necessary infrastructure was not contained in the bill itself. Much of it has to be promulgated through regulation. The regulation comes through three primary um, areas in the federal government, Department of Labor, um, Department of Revenue, or uh, the Treasury, and also Health and Human Services. So that doesn't move fast. Mostly the Patient Protection Act, what we call PPACA, is uh, focused on health insurance reform. It's primarily reform of access to the market, and there are a lot of conditions that are not addressed substantially for the private sector, which is where we function in this arena, and that's cost containment. So for the Montana University System Employee Group Benefit Plan, there are four primary things that we have to address immediately. Those are new benefits that must, or coverage that must be extended in, as of July of 2011. We must increase the dependent age to 26 years. We must eliminate lifetime maximums in our benefit plan, and that has a, um, a substantial amount of impact, um, poten potentially. We must provide a preventive benefit mandate schedule, which um, has an amount of cost, and we must eliminate pre-existing conditions for any of our plan members who are age 19 and younger. The total cost of that is $2.3 million, estimated by our actuary for fiscal year 12, and $2.5 million for fiscal year 13. So those are costs on top of normal health care inflation that we were already experiencing. So we did begin to work with the Interunit Benefits Committee comprised of both uh, administrative and labor representatives who are from all of the campuses that work on developing and implementing the benefit plan that we all enjoy. Things that happened in advance that set us up very well, and I, I would um, really like to say that the Interunit Benefits Committee and Mr. Bogmill were very foresightful in setting up much of this. We did make benefit changes in fiscal year 10 and 11 that positioned us very well to manage through some of these costs. One of the main ones that you may remember was implementation of a really um, a groundbreaking pharmacy program um, called URX, and that will be a significant asset to us as we move forward. Then the benefit changes for fiscal year in 12 and 13, the Inter Unit Benefits Committee has made a number of changes to close a financial gap. Let me jump to that. We have a lot of challenges in our benefit plan, um, and the least of it is PPACA, that's one aspect. But we have increasing medical and pharmacy inflation, and as you're aware, there was no proposal for increased funding for the employer contribution in the governor's pay plan proposed before the legislature. That's the first time since, I believe, 1991, the first time in 16 years we haven't had an increase. Taken all together, those cost factors and reductions in revenue streams impact us to the um, $9.7 million funding shortfall in fiscal year 12 and a $19 million funding sh shortfall in fiscal year 13. We always have to address some kind of gap. We always have medical trend to deal with. And so as such, we have implemented a number of benefit plan changes um, and to address some of the uh, structural issues in our plan and the Interunit Benefits Committee has made those decisions and just recently finished that work. As a result, between the reconfiguration of the plan and increase in premiums, and we will have to see some increase in premiums, we're able to close that funding gap for fiscal year 12, and we believe we're well on the way to addressing it for fiscal year 13. What you will see for our employees is, on average, employees will see an increase of about 7% in their premiums. Uh, retirees, depending on whether they're Medicare or non-Medicare eligible, will see uh, increases on average ranging from 7 to 12 percent. Now, when you take a look at the fact that our plan this year is projected to spend about $75 million and we have a $10 million gap, that's pretty good that we're able to balance it that well. So I think that we've served our plan members well and we've positioned ourselves well for the future to deal with these issues. 
um, and a number of our, our uh, peer plans are struggling with these same things, and I think that we've done a very good job. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Regent McKenna. Uh, thank you very much for the report. <clears throat> a couple of questions and uh, just some context. I mean, as a small business, in, in my case, you know, this is a huge conversation. We're trying to address this too. And so I, I guess I'd like to just further understand the benefit package as it is written. Uh, and if we could use this time since we're talking about group benefits, maybe talk about the retirement plan down the road. But I have a few questions related to this. Um, is there, what's the participation, participation rate of our employees? Is everybody automatically enrolled in this insurance pool or can people search their own options? Mr. Chairman, uh, Regent Buchanan, the way our plan works is virtually all of our employees do take that because what we offer as an employer is a uh, employer contribution uh, that goes to every employee. So virtually all of them have that. There are a few folks that if they have, for example, they come from a military background and they have generous benefits through another program, may waive our coverage, but essentially they will take it. So uh, as far as an individual versus a family, what, what kind of contribution are we making? What are the expenses on, what, what are the employee's expenses and what are our expenses in those two cases? Okay. Montana was very foresightful in how we set up our employer contribution. We set this up in law back in 1979. The university system plan was created in the 80s. Um, and what we did is set up a flat rate, a defined contribution rate that we really provide for our health care plan. Currently, that's $733 per employee as long as the employee meets the eligibility guidelines, the, the work requirements. So whether you cover your family or whether you cover just yourself, that same amount is the same. And the employees in total for the benefit plan, 80% of the cost of the plan approximately, and this has remained very constant over those years, has been paid by the employer contribution and 20% is paid by the plan participants in the form of premiums to bring on their dependents or for retirees. So for an individual, is it uh, subject to health or anything, but as far as our contribution to match that, what are the total premium expenses? Or is it it's a system contribution, as I want to understand? It's not per employee, it's a system contribution to make it actuarial? Uh, the Regent Buchanan, the way it is a per employee contribution. So it's $733 per cost. employee, plus their cost. Okay. And then we're required statutorily to fund this on an actuarial basis. Okay. Um, eligibility, you mentioned that. What, what, how do we deem eligibility for participation? Eligibility is deemed based on um, your work status. So uh, you have to work um, half time or better or uh, be engaged in an employment contract. So we follow much of the same guidelines that are followed in private sector. Okay. Uh, you mentioned retiree coverage. Um, mm -hmm. Are all of our retirees covered? And to what extent do we identify how much coverage and for how long? Mr. Chairman, Regent Buchanan, no, not all of our retirees are covered. Um, this is one of those places where I think Montana was pretty innovative and ahead of the curve where a lot of states are trying to get right now. Actually in law, what it says is we do not, the uh, retiree is responsible for 100% of the premium, and that's been since 1979. However, what we do is we do subsidize a portion of the retiree's premium. So uh, right now that's about, um, on average, about one-third of the cost is paid by the retirees, about two-thirds by the system. Um, that's remained fairly constant, I, uh, and we have been able to, as we're dealing with our funding issues, work on moving more of those costs and more of the cost share um, so that it's an appropriate balance between the employer and the subsidization and the retiree. So, and again, are all retirees of the system automatically covered by this? Uh, no, Regent Buchanan, they are not. They have an option when they retire, and the way it works is at the point that you become eligible to retire, you must make a one-time election whether you're going to remain on the benefit plan or not. If you choose not to make an election to remain on the benefit plan, you are not eligible to continue. So we have, I believe, we our estimate is about um, something less than half, about 45% of our employees actually opt to stay on the benefit plan because they do have a contribution and they have to pay 100% of the premium. And finally, uh, you referenced comparative, this is comparative somewhat to the private sector. Where are you finding that data for the state of Montana and what uh, us as business, as private sector people are paying? How, is, how, would you, how do you get that data? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Regent Buchanan, a couple places. One is um, I do work closely and came from the health insurance industry. So a lot of um, staying close to the actual folks who are selling the, the uh, coverage out there. 
One of the common coverages that's out there for businesses, for example, is generally when health insurance is written, the insurer will require that the employer pay half the contribution toward the coverage in order to avoid adverse selection. So that's a pretty common industry norm out there, and it's employed by all three health insurers, domestic health insurers in Montana. Um, depending on the size of the employer, that will influence how much of a contribution there is toward the health insurance. I previously served on the Insure Montana board and was part of implementing that program, so that, that was to assist small businesses primarily in affordability and health care coverage. And that was one of the reasons is to help them meet that obligation as an employer and as a participant. Thank you very much, Connie. Ms. Mm -hmm. Rose, you, you mentioned um, that the, you said it was, it, it was in the law that 100%, a retiree must pay 100% of the benefit. But then you said, but we subsidize it to a third. How, how does that work? Mr. Chairman, uh, the difference is in the language. What the law says is the retiree must pay 100% of the premium. They don't have to pay 100% of the cost. So in insurance and looking at the difference between the premium, which is what we charge for the, the services, versus what the actual underlying cost is, because we do um, subsidize that amount. So. As an example, what's the best way to describe? In a family plan, for example, you are not going to pay 100% of the cost of covering your spouse and child generally. People who um, are healthier and younger are going to subsidize that premium. How is the premium different than the cost? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the reason is because of the way that we rate is we will take a look at um, spreading the risk across the individual. So we will average, for example, for an individual employee, we take a look at the state share. That employer contribution is more than is necessary to pay for the cost of the individual. But it was always predicated on helping to pay a portion of the cost of putting dependents on coverage and supporting retirees coverage. So we have what would be termed a community pool rate for our, our employees as opposed to what would be an experience rate, which would be your actual cost beats your premium. So even for current employees, does that reduce the cost of what family benefits would be? Mr. Chairman, it does. Do, do you know what the average cost for a spouse or a family is? Um, Mr. Chairman, currently the average cost for a um, family would be about $1,100 to $1,200 if we actually charge them their actual cost. However, our premiums vary from 700 to this year about $1,000. So if it's a $1,000 premium, then we're, we're still paying the first $733, so they'd be paying a couple hundred dollars? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Mr. Buchanan. I guess I'm confused. I thought I heard you say that the cost to the employee was $733 per employee for the plan. Uh, Regent Buchanan, no. The employer contribution, so what the university system provides as a benefit is a flat $733 per employee. So if you're an individual, that's 100% of your premium, is that right? Chairman Buchanan, yes. That will cover the full cost of your coverage as an individual. And as an employer, that, that was the way that we developed what is essentially our defined contribution. Funding. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Wells, thank you. Uh, real quick, I'm looking at my notes, forgot a couple questions. What is the coverage? I mean, on my plan, I'm up to out of pocket $6,000 each year and a deductible to my family, and after that, it's 80 20. What is the coverage? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Buchanan, or uh, Regent Buchanan, what our coverage is, we offer six different plans actually, um, but there are a couple major differences. One of them is a fairly low deductible plan. It's a managed care plan. So it requires you to, to uh, pick different um, providers that are within a network. So it's more restrictive. <coughs> right now, that deductible for an individual is $350. It will go to $500 July 1. We also have what would be a real traditional indemnity plan, an old-fashioned kind of insurance coverage. That currently, that coverage ranges, we have two different levels of that from 450 to, I believe it is $600 for the deductible for an individual. That will go to a flat amount of $600. We're, we're aggregating that in, um, uh, I'm sorry, it will go to a flat amount of 1,000 on July 1st. Is it 100% coverage after that or? 
No, Mr. Uh, Regent Buchanan, it is not. We actually have a 75-25 plan. So we have had a plan where we have had more employee cost sharing. Um, that's been more common to us for the last 20 plus years. Thank you very much, Ms. Rush. Any other questions? Okay. All right, thank you very much. Regent Buchanan. Yeah, thank you. I do have some questions not related to this, and maybe this isn't the time to provide the answers. But um, first of all, you know, from my perspective, uh, it sounds like we have a pretty awesome plan for our employees. And as I hear about the changes, there certainly has been consternation and concern uh, voiced to uh, us and me individually from certain employees. But I would remind you that the scenario is not near as generous for most of us in the private sector. We, uh, especially for business owners. Uh, you know, we as those who are generating revenue, which pay our salaries, pay these insurance premiums on behalf of the state, uh, remind all of us as that discussion is uh, undergoing that, uh, you know, your counterparts in the private sector may have a much more difficult situation. So first of all, pay note to that. But I would like to at some point, I don't know if this is appropriate time, uh, also start to learn about our retirement plans and what kind of benefits employees of the system get. And I deferred to, to Deputy Commissioner McRae for that. I don't know if this is the time for that question or if we could ask for a report at, at coming meetings so that we're aware of. Uh... I could give you just a, a, a really quick overview and also something that's relevant to some legislation that's, that's been introduced. Um, <clears throat> very generally, and I don't have these numbers right down to the decimal point, but there are two types of retirement plans. A traditional pension defined benefit plan that's based upon uh, employer and employee contributions within a prescribed benefit that the employee is entitled to. That's a traditional public defined benefit plan such as teacher retirement system or the public employee retirement system. Um, right now in the Montana University system, the majority, the vast majority of, well, the other type of plan then is a defined contribution, which is similar to a private sector 401k where uh, there is an employer contribution and an employee contribution, but rather than going into a central defined pension system, that money actually just goes to individual accounts of the employees and employees have a selection of mutual funds and so forth. So that's a defined contribution. Two types of plans. The vast majority of our faculty and contract professionals, contract administrators, are in the defined contribution plan because uh, the, the, the way the development of that plan worked statutorily and within the Montana University system, uh, after 1993, every newly hired faculty member or contract professional or administrator um, is required to be in that defined contribution plan. The employer contribution to each employee's account uh, is equivalent to five 0.96% of the employee's salary versus a defined benefit pension plan, which um, we still have a few longtime faculty who are, are in who, who have not yet retired, uh, or for classified staff, about one third of our employees who are in the uh, public employee retirement system defined benefit plan. Uh, for, for those employees in defined benefit pension, the employer contribution is closer to 7 to 8 percent, depending upon whether you're TRS or PERS. That money goes directly then into the pension system, and those employees' benefits are rather than self-directed in mutual funds where the employee assumes all the risk, like the majority of our faculty and administrators do, the majority of our classified staff um, opt for the traditional formulaic pension. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that defined contribution plan, are those, uh, that 5.9% employer contribution, is that regardless if the employee is participating? Or is it contingent upon their participation to the same level? Uh, I, off the top of my head, and I don't know this to the decimal, the employee's contribution is almost comparable to that, but and there might be some Let ORP me ask the members. question a different way, Kevin. Uh, with most of the plans that I see, you do not get any of the employer contribution unless you yourself contribute. So it's a dollar-to-dollar -dollar match or something that to that correct. effect. Yes. Great. Requires dual contribution, the employee and the employer, yes. What, what about other benefits? What about things like disability insurance and long I mean, we, do we provide those things for our employees as well? Mr. Chairman, Chairman, uh, Regent Buchanan, yes, we do. We offer um, vision, dental benefits. We do have a long-term disability coverage package, um, and those are the kind of benefits that we offer in addition. Structured similarly, are we 100% are we of that premium? Are we paying for those premiums 100% like we are with the health insurance for individuals? 
Regent Buchanan, those are paid by the employee. Uh, like and it. so if you're a single employee, you do have enough employer contribution left over that you can purchase those type of benefits. Uh, but if you are one who covers your family, it's 100% out of pocket. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess I'd ask uh, Mr. Chairman, Deputy Commissioner McRae, uh, if there is the opportunity for us to do some comparative analysis as to uh, what some private sector, uh, I don't know if the Department of Labor provides any sort of report showing what a typical business in Montana is providing, I sure would like to see that. Uh, and then the last question is, is, we're referencing how this has changed in recent years. I'm sure this is a regent discussion if we're making changes to these types of plans and uh, are we anticipating any changes? Is there a discussion of any changes on the horizon? I'm, I'm going to ask the commissioner for a quick glimpse of something I know she has thought about, but when I think of the, the majority of employees in the university system, uh, contract faculty, contract professionals and administrators are in that defined contribution plan and the employer's contribution of 5.96% towards each employee's account is the lowest in the nation. That is a plan that goes through TIAA CREF, so where, you know, for faculty and administrators where we are in a kind of a national recruitment and retention competition, the TIAA CREF uh, defined contribution plan is sort of the coin of the realm and people nationwide are familiar with it. So therefore, when they are, uh, comparing our employment to our competitors, other, other public or private sector universities and colleges. Um, they're very aware of comparing what the employer's contribution is as well. One of the difficulties from a recruitment and retention standpoint for contract faculty and administrators and professionals, uh, as, you, as you may know, our, our faculty salaries are the lowest in the nation the 5.96% employer contribution is also the lowest in the nation. So from a competitive recruitment and retention standpoint, that's a bit of a double whammy. When people are deciding whether to come to Montana or stay in Montana, we have the lowest employer contribution towards retirement on top of the lowest salary. Um, every legislative session, MEA MFT does sponsor a bill to uh, propose to increase the employer contribution a little bit two years ago or four years ago, one or the other, the employer contribution four years ago increased from 4.96% to 5.96%. MEAFT had another bill um, that did not pass this session. I believe the national average is somewhere around eight to 9%. Wyoming is either 11 or 14%. Um, Commissioner Stearns, you have talked about how if, you know, at some point, that becomes even uh, a more extreme recruitment and retention impediment than it is right now. Um, what options we might have for regent level discussion about what legal and, and, and fiscal options could we have to improve that regardless of legislative action? Um, yeah, actually, uh, Regent Buchanan and, and Mr. McCray, I, you said it's just one of the handful of, of items that we have on our list to watch really careful on the recruitment and, and competitive uh, retention thing. We, we don't propose in, in this kind of economy to do anything, but we have it on our radar to bring to the board um, in follow up from the recruitment retention task force of a couple years ago. That was one of the issues identified and we continue to have it on our radar. Obviously we haven't elevated it in the in a time when when even getting when we've been in a basic pay freeze and, and other um, kind of stringent times. So I don't I'm not sure that gets to your question, though, so I want you to expand on that, if you may. If it does get to the question, but I, I would say that uh, I think there's some contextual observation that's extremely important here. I mean, Montana is one of two states that's still fiscally pretty darn strong. While we're listening to a conversation where many states are identifying exactly this as an opportunity to fix their budget. So uh, as much as I appreciate uh, your statement of how challenging the environment is for us, I would say that some excessive plans such, plan, excessiveness in plans like this around the country have led to some imbalance in budgets. Um, so I, you know, I don't subscribe to comparative analysis limited to the university system. We're talking about people who are neighbors with people in the private sector who have seen their contributions from employers frozen for the last couple of years, eliminated, zero percent. So I, you know, as much as I am sensitive to it and want to certainly be aware that we need to strive to demonstrate uh, every feasible tool we can to recognize uh, the the appreciation we have for our employees, uh, we cannot operate in the vacuum that I'm hearing uh, a little bit with that suggestion uh, because our neighbors who generate the revenue which fund all of this uh, have seen a very dramatic change towards the other direction in the private sector. So 
Uh, I would like, Kevin, if it was possible to look at some comparative analysis, yep. not in our university, we see it all the time, but to uh, private sector versus public sector uh, in the state at some time, no rush. Uh, I'm sure this is a I'd discussion be happy that's to, evolving. To I appreciate the, uh, appreciate Agent the Hamilton. Route. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to follow up on Regent Buchanan's comment because I think in Montana, and, and I read something not that long ago about this, we, we do have a structural imbalance in our uh, state retirement program that's fairly significant. In fact, it's gained kind of regional attention in some pub publications. So while I think we manage our program well, I think we do have some larger issues of, of state funding that we need to pay attention to long term. Absolutely. Regent McLean. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'm, I'm here at the table. I'm hearing a, a health insurance plan being defined as, as, as perhaps excessive, and, and correct me if, if I'm wrong. Um, I think that the health coverage plan offered to Mon the Montana University system employees, I think, uh, is, is a good plan, a plan whose benefits have been offered um, and continued, I think, when salary increases um, and other benefits have not. And uh, I guess I'm deeply bothered by, by the dialogue here, and I, and I think that it is important. Um, but our workers across the system They take these health insurance benefits as part of their compensation packages. And we need to recognize the value in something good um, when we see it. And we're advocating right now for a 1% pay increase for these university system employees, which won't even begin to touch the increase that they're going to be expected to pay based on what I just heard. And so if I have misread the dialogue here at this table, I sincerely apologize, but I don't think that I have. And I think it is an imperative that we recognize the high caliber folks that we have, some of whom are in this room and the majority of whom are back on our campuses doing the good work that we expect them to do and that makes students want to come to this system and be a part of this system year in and year out. And to identify a compensation package as a part of a health insurance package as excessive for workers who have taken a pay freeze is beyond my comprehension. And I will end it there, but I, I am deeply bothered by that dialogue when I know so much that everyone around this table values the good work that is being done by the faculty and the staff on our campuses. Other comments? Okay. We will move to uh, item B of the information agenda, which was compensation procedures. Uh, I think this is just an overview from Commissioner Stearns and Associate Commissioner McCray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, uh, I placed this on our agenda, I think kind of at the request, at least the implicit request of several of you over the course of the, at least the last two board meetings and maybe I think for the past year or so of questions about what either explicit or implicit guidelines are we following, particularly the, the chancellors and the two presidents and my office when we have new hires um, into faculty and administrative ranks, but particularly uh, senior administrative ranks and you know what policies are relating to that and what are the employee sectors, whether it's classified staff or others. So with Mr. McRae's help, we put together the document, which I think you can go ahead and click on. This document is now on file just as a summary for you members of the board, uh, answering some of the questions, first of all, before I hope we can get to some 
discussion of this because we are finding we need more guidance from you. We're not at the point where we might present to you a resolution that you would vote on or a new policy or an elaboration of a policy, although I, I think as I've been looking at this, there may be a bit of a policy gap, as Lynn would call it. The first question, how does the Board of Regents exercise its authority to set or adjust compensation? And we identify there the, the four big employee groups because it's a little bit different for each of them. But as you go down that, with number one, you can see our one big employee group, of course, is the support staff in the board approved classified pay plan. That's nearly 2,800 of our employees. The next group um, is a little different about, and that's nearly 2,500 contract faculty members, um, almost all of whom now are members of a collective bargaining entity. Stop right there and, and you can click on this and click further to policy 711.4, um, which is just in our policy manual of how we, how we, how we uh, adjust or reach collective bargaining agreements. But I want to pause on that one for a moment because in at least some of the, perhaps all, but I know at least some of the collective bargaining agreements, there is a mechanism to work with the union, with the faculty, and um, prior to that with the MSU faculty with, within their policy to work with them if to make merit adjustments or recruitment retention adjustments. And we do that. We do that on a fairly regular basis. It's not, it's not often, but I would say it is maybe once a month. It might be, I'm kind of guessing here, members of the board, but it might be a dozen Maybe, maybe 20 faculty members a year who are particularly valuable. They are highly sought by some other college or university. They do, particularly to the issues of uh, compression or inversion, their, their salary uh, has been sort of surpassed by fairly new hires coming into the system. And, and so, case reserve or some place in Cleveland is going to lure them away from, from us for 15,000 more dollars. And uh, they would just as soon stay. It might be a real attractive package. And usually the president or the chancellor through the president calls it to our attention. And we have the collective bargaining right to discuss it with, you know, the union takes a look at it. We have budgeted for it. In other words, the campuses have uh, a small reserve for this probably a half a dozen times, maybe not that many, but where either the Provost Brown or President Engstrom speaks with the, um, with the head of the uh, UFA, at, I'm using UM as an example, obviously, and they say, yes, this makes sense, and they give us the exact reasons, and Mr. McRae and I, and we often have um, Deputy Commissioner Moore and Deputy Commissioner Robinson look at it with us as well, we bring out our magnifying glasses and our, our um, most conservative bent. We look at their justification in terms of, is this truly competitive? Is this just a, an end around us to get a raise for a particular individual? When we are convinced, and it's hard to convince us, then we say, yes, we approve that, and it's all according to contract, Hoyle, and process, and review. So the next group, number three, for non-faculty, non-administrator contract professional employees, there are about 1,350 of those in the system, professional level positions, neither faculty nor administrator. Just a couple of those come to your attention, and that's generally in the area of head coaches. Um, but for the most part, those are, you know, follow that same policy, 711.1, and occasionally, uh, I, I remember the example of a registrar on one of our campuses. Good registrars are really hard to come by, and we were about to lose one uh, to a, another state. And we talked that over with the campus. I don't even remember which campus it was. And within the authority that you have delegated to us, and that's kind of at the heart of what I want a little more guidance from you members of the board, is how comfortable you are in delegating to us some of these decisions. Um, because there's, there's room for, for um, clarity there. 
So we do occasionally make those decisions, and I'm, I'm sure that the two presidents could comment, and they both served as provosts, and, and that often those occur on the, on the provost level. The president sends us to us, but the analysis was done by people such as Royce when he was a provost. And then finally, in an area that is probably the most complex for uh, my office is for contract administrators. We have about 180 full-time equivalent employees in designated administrative positions, and about 100 of them we work with and treat very similar to that category number three. But you have delegated to us um, for those. But for about 80 other administrators are subject to that policy that the link is shown there, 711.2. Those positions are on Board of Regents contracts. We don't call them MUS contracts. We call them yours, Board of Regents contracts. And those we bring to you either for change or for new hires. Now, I'm calling this to your attention just for conversation and guidance among yourselves so that we can maybe um, head toward a little bit of mm, clarity within a meeting or two on this issue because there are, look at those positions. Uh, of course, it includes presidents, commissioner, deputy or associate commissioners, vice presidents, provosts, and so forth, chancellors, deans of the um, colleges of technology in Helen and Great Falls, legal counsel. The, and it's, it is not quite as difficult, I think, well, it is difficult for you. You, you faced it when you hired two new presidents um, in the last year. But what is hard for us, especially for me and your two presidents, is the part in that policy that says, we shall bring to you a proposed salary. And this presumes that we have done a search. We've followed the proper procedures. Sometimes the individual, it's hard regardless. The person may be uh, at the end of the search from a neighboring state, and we think that that person ought to be willing to kind of take the salaries that we're accustomed to, and occasionally they're not. Their neighboring state is, uh, you know, it's, we're, we're not competitive. Yeah, and so we bring that to your attention and we struggle, and you struggle. Um, and it's gotten rather awkward. The second awkward situation is when in that national search, someone from the state of Montana, someone from within the university system has surfaced to the top, and that is the person that we want to, to hire the position, but it is for a new position. And there, is, there, is, there are different understandings among you. Is that person getting a raise, or is that person getting a new salary for a new position? I have taken the position, perhaps wrongly, I tend to think that that person having competed in a national or regional search is uh, that the salary has to take into account now the new position that they competed for. But I have had reasonable questions from some of you about that, and so I promised. And then it's awkward. If I bring it here in, in staff and comp and that individual is sitting in the audience, Someone might think, hmm, are we arguing about their salary because maybe we think that isn't a terrific new hire. That's never the case. You, you know that, I know that, and you never intend for that to be. So I want, I've been looking for a meeting where I could bring this discussion when we didn't have anyone on the consent agenda that you, everyone would be looking around the room to say, who are we talking about here that maybe we think we're about to pay them too much money or give them too much money. So this is in the abstract, truly, to uh, Mr. Chairman, get a little bit more discussion from you and guidance if we need to add to our policy or some such, we'd be glad to do it. But right now, and I'm sure the presidents will echo this and probably give more precise examples, we are struggling with this uncertainty. Thank you. I guess there's a little more rationale with further scrolling, according to Kevin. But I guess uh, um, I've, said, I've said why I need a little bit of discussion, and we don't have to go till noon or anything. But I would love to have more discussion from you, and I would appreciate it so much. And I know that the presidents and chancellors would as well. Thank you. There we go. Right there. What are the boards concerned? Questions? 
Madam Commissioner, thank I thank you so very much for your uh, your leadership in this regard, and I look forward to uh, being part of the discussion. Um, I've spent some time looking at the policies referenced here, and I think that there may be some ambiguity that maybe we could fine tune over some discussions uh, by the next, for example, and looking at one of them, 711-1, and it talks about uh, they will be administered in accordance with guidelines, and so these are exactly the guidelines that you're asking yeah. for, so yeah. thank you. Regent Buchanan. <clears throat> Chairman Christian, uh, Commissioner Stearns, thank you very much for bringing this up for discussion. And uh, I certainly don't have the answers, but I might share some of my perspective to help kind of frame what uh, I'm one of those that asked for this dialogue a little bit. And thank you. So, as, you know, I recognize that I'm a member of a seven member board. And what I, th what I think may be very different than the person who sits next to me. Uh, and I also understand the responsibility of that. When the board has a quorum or a decision in which direction they move, uh, although dissent may be voiced, you certainly don't, you get out of the way of the institution and support it. And, and I get that. And in the last couple of uh, years, we've had some discussions where, as we're looking at salary increases or uh, expectations with new hires, I've been a little, I've, I've felt like I've lacked that opportunity to get a consensus from the rest of the board as to where we should go. So just the discussion helped a lot. I would compliment us on the way that we handled uh, a couple of searches recently. Uh, we talked about it. I had the opportunity to say I'm not, on, I'm not comfortable or I'm, I may think differently than the quorum. The board moved forward and it's worked out great for the institution. I think that's very much part of this conversation. So what I think I would encourage is uh, as much discussion related to a change in status quo that we see coming on the front end so we can avoid a public embarrassment or you know whatever it might be that causes this consternation so uh, that's one thought um, along that line when we are uh, we've got to be so contextual about so many of our decisions I mean what's going on around us uh, currently we're talking about an economic situation which is the conversation uh, that we're all a part of and so again to have that dialogue about expectations as a board I think will only serve us better in particular with our messaging to those who trust us to be the stewards of the higher education system. Uh, now internally, I, I do think, I found some, uh, I've made some observations that have kind of, I feel like we get ourselves in kind of in a corner or, or our back up against the wall some ways that we go about things. Um, I've been a part of a couple of searches lately and the search committee who's not often composed of us, members on these campuses come together and they describe the expected qualifications they come up with the criteria in which the search is going to do, or is going to look for. Um, and a couple of the criteria and qualification expectations are looking for Superman. And Superman costs a lot of money. Uh, so somehow we've got to have the ability to at least have the voice of this board at that construction stage, at the grassroots level, whether we're looking for uh, one of these numerous administrative positions, uh, whatever it is. Um, because as I looked at some of the, in, on a couple of these searches, as you look at uh, the type of people that are eligible for the positions we're looking for. I mean, they're way out of what we've been paying. And there's not a candidate in that pool that might be a part of the pay rate, in that area that we are comfortable with. And again, uh, you know, no fault. I mean, we all want to expect the best. I, I think what I would hope is that our dialogues related to expectations, tolerance uh, of, of uh, expense and those types of things somehow is implemented into that front end conversation on that search committee so we don't find ourselves at the end being forced to consider finalists that are way out of what has been a normal pay range. Um, I would summarize by saying this dialogue in itself gives me confidence that we as a board will have the opportunity moving forward with each of these uh, issues to have you know, our handprint on it. And you know, when we look at the process, a lot of times these things come up through consent agenda. Um, and, you know, I may not agree with, definitely not ever, I try not and certainly trust that we all do not ever put personal agendas, as you put, it's not a person focused, it's uh, some element of management decisions related to salaries that make me feel uncomfortable. It's, it's never been the person. Uh, but I, I guess I'm wondering, okay, so if I disagree with what a consent agenda, I don't want to pull out that item, embarrass that person, uh, bring up, I don't want to do that. So the question I would then have is where do I get to say I don't agree? And either it's on the front end, where we as a board have said, here's the tolerance level, whether I'm in the quorum or not, I'm going to live with the board's directive. 
or maybe it's the hindsight. Uh, do I express that in the evaluation of the person who made the decision to elevate this as a board item? Uh, so again, I appreciate the conversation and think we're headed down the right direction just talking about it and would encourage much more communication uh, as we move forward prior to the commencement of a lot of these processes. Thank you. Thank you, Regent McCannon. Um, my, my off the cuff response to the, to the last part is I think the ones that are directly under our control, we should work together uh, to have those conversations up front. And I think the ones that are not directly under our control, uh, probably the appropriate place is the evaluation of those making the hires. Um, it's a good conversation, though. It, it, it's not an easy situation. I was just thinking about your Commissioner Stearns, your request for some guidance. And I, I don't know if a 27-page matrix would, uh, it, there's just always so many nuances to each of these decisions uh, that it's difficult. But I think the conversation is, is what we need to have and try to get, as you say, uh, Regent Buchanan, the, the quorum as comfortable as we can and, and move forward. It, it, there isn't any right answers. and. Uh, Pay doesn't always define compensation. Doesn't always define whether that person will be successful or not. And yet, there's, uh, you know, this. Certainly, I have a need to man this system with the absolute best people that we possibly can. And those sort of always that seem to be at opposite. But uh, the conversation should help us move it along, and we'll pledge to do that. Any other thoughts, Regent Hamilton? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate uh, Regent Buchanan's point of view, um, and I've seen this process pretty much go 180 degrees <laughs> over the past few years. Um, when I first came on the board, we actually reviewed every single contract position description in detail. I mean, we knew what portion of the salary was for benefits, for other compensation, for other duties as assigned, and we got into extensive hour-long conversations over what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate in, in that model. And it was, I think, uncomfortable, not just for some board members, but for everyone in the room, because you had a name attached to the salary line. And um, you, we would see names come in, in consecutive meetings at times because of the changing nature of the job and what the demands were placed on that of individual by the campus. So I think I'm comfortable with the guidelines we've set. I think uh, Regent Christian or Chairman Christian's con comment about paying attention to the ones that we do hire and using the evaluation process to um, supervise, manage, and control the others is, or manage and control the others is uh, uh, totally appropriate. Um, and personally, I wouldn't feel comfortable drilling down to the position description level at the, at the onset of a search, um, just because I don't know what the duties that position might have on a campus. And that position on a large campus may, it may have the same title, but it may have totally different responsibilities on a smaller campus. And I think that's the job, from my perspective, of our managers to deal with, with that kind of thing. So those are just my thoughts from a historical perspective. <laughs> the historian, President Ingstrom. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, just a couple of comments. First, I very much appreciate the commissioner bringing this forward from a process point of view. I think the more we discuss that process and the more clarity we can bring, the, the, the better it is for President Cruzado and I and the others to manage higher education in Montana. So I think a healthy discussion about that process and where the authority lies is a really good one. Uh, to me, though, um, I would encourage us to have that discussion in the context of maybe a broader uh, philosophical question in a way. And that is, where, where do we really want our higher education system to stack up in sort of the, the, where our nation is? I mean, we, we talk uh, quite a bit about our retention rates 
as they compare to peer institutions. We talk about our graduation rates. We talk about our research productivity, and we, we can't help but compare that to the productivity of institutions in other states around the country and so on. And we, we li those of us in higher education live in that world on kind of a daily basis. President Cruzado and I uh, will leave tomorrow for the meeting in Washington, D.C., American Council on Higher Education, or on Education, rather. And uh, we'll be there with our peers, and, and inevitably, conversation will focus around, well, how are you doing on retention? How are you doing on research, and so on? And, and in a way, it gets to where do we want to be as a competitive state in this business? Uh, where in the spectrum of the most efficient in the country to the highest investment in the country would be the other end. Where, where in, that, in that spectrum should we reside as a state? Do we want to be the most efficient? Do we want to be the one that makes the least invest or the small, smallest investment? Or do we want to be in the top uh, half? Do we want to be in the third, you know, the bottom third? And I don't know the answer to those, and it's this struggle between trying to uh, um, compare ourselves on a national basis to uh, what is the right thing for the state of Montana and how do we stack up as public employees compared to private employees and all of that. But I think some philo philosophical discussion among the board, just where do, where do we want to position ourselves as a higher education system in relation to what the rest of the world does? And that kind of gives us some guidance then. Do, you know, do, we, do we look for uh, people out there nationally that we have to pay 50, at the 50 percentile level or the 25th percentile level? So that's a philosophical discussion, not an easy one by any means and not a short one. But giving President Cruzado and I uh, and the commissioner some guidance as to where in that spectrum do we think we need to be as a higher education system would be very helpful, actually. Thank you. Comments? Yeah, what do we want to be when we grow up? Yeah. <laughs> Regent Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll take a stab at uh, President Engstrom's question. Um, I, I think we should be proud of our, of our position nationally through the Delta cost study and those types of things for our efficiencies um, and our effectiveness. Um, and I, I think we can do better when it comes to being competitive in faculty salaries and benefits. I don't think we're going to get a lot of state support to do that. And I think that means we're going to have to reallocate internally the resources that we have and look to private sector resources to help us out. Um, and, and I mean that in terms of, comp this is a big change for me, because I mean that in terms of compensation. And I, for years, advocated that salaries were the responsibility of the state, we're public institutions. We're not public institutions anymore. We're publicly assisted institutions. And we have lots of partners out there that are willing to help us in a lot of different ways. And we need to be prepared to take advantage of that and make the asks. And I think our campus leaders are doing that right now. Um, it's just not as transparent to us maybe as, as board members. Um, I, on the other hand, I don't think we need to be at the top of the scale in what we pay our highly qualified and excellent professionals. I think there is still a, a cachet and a value to being able to come to Montana and live the kind of lifestyle that we have. And I think we have been successful in the past in recruiting and retaining top quality people, largely because of the full package we present, not just because of the salary package. So I think there's a way, you know, we don't want to get into the, the the really the kinds of things that have created the economic condition we're in right now from some people's perspectives of exorbitant um, executive salaries that aren't tied to the relationship of the employees who are actually doing the work. And I think we do a good job of that in the university system. I think there's, there's a visible and rational relationship between all levels of how we um, manage compensation and benefits in the Montana University system. Thank you. 
President Cruzado. Mr. Chair, members of the board, at the same time that we have a philosophical conversation that is very much needed and appreciated, I would like to encourage the, the board to take a look at some of our policies that might be hindering uh, some flexibility that the presidents need and the chancellors need, uh, and that actually can be uh, counterproductive. For example, <clears throat> in our policies, we do have uh, a provision for a retention offer. And we specify that should a faculty member go out and get an offer for another job elsewhere, at that moment, we can come back and make an offer. And actually, that faculty member can do that every two years per our policy. Well, I think that it's a good opportunity for us to rethink about that. Can we, rather than encouraging faculty to go out and look at other worlds, give our administrators the flexibility to come up with preemptive uh, offers and say, don't go there. You don't need to. We value here, you here. Um, and also the provision of every two years encourages lack of loyalty to the system. So those are things that, that are our, our disposal. Another opportunity that we have in front of us, I would like for us to take a look at policies for our, board, for our region's professorships so that it's standardized throughout the system so that a region's professor means a region's professor, uh, whether it's in Missoula or it's in Bozeman or et cetera. What are the criteria? What are we looking for? How do individuals aspire to that very select and prestigious uh, uh, label attached to their names in recognitions of their, of their track records and contribution to the Montana uh, University system? Those are some very specific policy items that can be tremendously helpful when we go out and recruit, but also retain and nurture the great faculty that we have. Thank you, President Cruzado. Regent Porn Paul. Thank you, Dr. Cruzado, for those words. I think um, I, I have seen that personally as a student. I've heard from other students that have had um, faculty members going through that exact experience. And, and I think what it does to their own morale is is incredibly devastating. I mean, it, it takes our faculty members looking elsewhere, and 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 that's a conversation they have to have with their their superiors and with their colleagues that that they're going outside. It, it's a real hit to their morale, and I can I can see that in faculty members that have had to go through this process. And moreover, it's a hit to our students as well because students and faculty members in a state as small as Montana have an have an incredibly tight relationship. And when do faculty members, when they have to go through this process of looking elsewhere for work, when do they have that time to do so? I mean, they have it during the week when colleges are in session, and that's during class time. And that's, you know, going outside of, of, of their class time. It's canceling class to be able to go to these interviews. And uh, I think it's, it's devastating on all accounts, and I think it's a policy that, that is um, a real hit to morale and a real hit to um, the quality of education as well. President Ingstrom, I, I guess my two cents on, on some of your comments is I, I think what I hear in, in the overlapping conversations is as a system, as a board, we're, we're tending to ask more questions about how many things can we do and maintain the high level of quality. And I think I, just for myself, I, I, that's, when I look at a, 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 our fiscal reality, um, we know there's limits. Uh, but, but I think that's where probably I fall more along the lines of I, I would like to be an extremely high quality provider in as much as we can do. And to what extent there's things we can't do, I certainly wouldn't like to see us sacrifice quality to do more things. And that's a balance that we've been talking about for a couple of days and I guess in my mind one that needs to continue. But I see resource balancing personally more along those lines than I do. Uh, any sacrifice of quality. And I think even in the hiring decisions we've made, that's sort of been my take since I've been on the board. I, I think we need to find the highest quality people that we can in every position, not, not only our administrative leaders, but our faculty and staff. I think 
that's what makes uh, Montana a unique opportunity for hiring and also makes Montana a tremendous value for the students who participate. All right. Um, uh, I would like to comment. Then to are we closing on this? Then? You can close on that. Commissioner Stern. Sounds like I've introduced a bill to the legislature and now I have a chance <laughs> to close, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Um, I guess I hear um, members of the board that you have a lot of both sympathy and empathy with the issue and uh, are probably happy for us to fill out maybe some particular policy gaps that could help us from our perspective um, and we'll talk about that with our presidents and chancellors. I, I would like to make the, uh, and, and maybe develop something then to bring back to you. I would like to make the observation, lest they think we are unaware of it, that um, I bet you that our faculty representative, Neil Moisey, has chaired or been on any number of faculty search committee committees in which he's faced exactly the same issue, in which he's got uh, eventually to answer to a dean or ultimately a provost to say, we really want this faculty member. This is the one, this is the best. This meets, this person meets all these needs. And um, can we go up, mm, you know, another 5,000, 10,000 to get that individual? Am I not right? It happens all the time. So it happens at every one of our competitive levels in our knowledge, uh, based competitive industry, and we're aware of that, so, lest you think we're not, that we know that you, you struggle with this as well. But I bring this forward because it, it just gets to be more obvious, you know, I, I, at the board level when, when a senior administrator's is, is name is on a consent or action agenda. So I have one coming up now, and fortunately, my memory does compartmentalize, and I actually cannot remember which campus it's from. I, I just remember that in the last week, a president said to me, I've got another one. I've got coming up in the next couple weeks, a search coming to a conclusion. The one we really want for this is probably going to be a little pricier than you are going to feel very comfortable with, but I will make a very good case as to why uh, due to investment, competitive reasons, need, availability across the country, this is the person we need and this is the price, we ha the uh, salary and benefits we have to offer. And what I hear you all saying is, you may be uncomfortable with what we bring forward, but you are trusting us to have the combination, you're giving us some flexibility and you're trusting us to have enough frugality and common sense and wisdom to do our best to make that as conservative as possible and to get what we need, knowing that we can't afford Cadillacs everywhere by any means. And so we will continue that, what I, that balance between you know, competitive investment and flexibility from you with the frugality of our Montana culture, ethic, and resource base. And so given that, even absent at this point any elaboration in our policies, I will have that conversation with whichever one of you it was, it was one of you who said that to me in a, the last few days, board meeting week, and especially when I've been testifying before full of probes, I'm not even going to think I'm having half Heimers at this point. I'm going to forgive myself for not remembering which one of you it was, but it's coming. It's coming, you said it to me, and we will resolve it in the next couple weeks and it will be on the consent or at full action agenda, whichever you all prefer. You chair, staff, and comp, so you'll, you'll tell me. And I shall bring it forward. And it will be with a name attached. If I shouldn't do that or do it quite that way, tell me now. Thank you. Regent McKenna. Uh, Commissioner Stearns, I appreciate that. The one thing I hear us saying that I want included in that is recognition that we've got to start refining our strategic focus. So if this person is the person or position on the campus where that niche is going to be strengthened, I think you're hearing us all say we support it. But if it's continuing to be thin across the, you know, that, that's part of, I'm hearing now, 
individually a quorum of this board say that that is something that we want to be focusing on. So please include that in the conversation and thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Okay. Um, I did want to, before we leave the information part of the agenda, I don't know if Connie's still here, but uh, we sort of moved from healthcare to, uh, no, you don't have to come back up. I just wanted to say we, we, we moved from the, your part of the discussion into benefits. We thank you for being here and uh, doing a good job managing that. I know 7% uh, increases never sounds great, but that is the lowest I've heard uh, in 2011 without dramatically changing the benefits, and uh, that speaks well to your group. It's, uh, it's an interesting time in healthcare, to say the least, and uh, we're, we appreciate your attention to it. Um, we have on our uh, consent agenda items A through G. We did basically 10-year review yesterday, gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so we're going to skip that one. Uh, does anybody want to pull any of those consent items out, or is it the sense of the committee we'd move those forward? Um, we also had uh, our, our comments from the UFA representative yesterday, so I will just call for public comment. Is there any public comment on items not on today's agenda? Any public comment? Okay, then we'll take, oh. Let me just ask one question. Since we're here, we've just looked at them. We're going to move back to the full board. Why don't we just vote on these consent agenda items right now? We can do that. As a full board, we done with this section. We can, uh, we'll act then as a uh, committee of the whole, and uh, is there? Move, I would move approval of uh, items A through G on the consent agenda for staff. Okay, then we have a, uh, a motion to approve items a through G of the Consent Agenda Staff and Compensation Committee. Um, is there any public comment on any of those items? Is there any comment from the campuses or uh, faculty, staff, students? Is there any board comment on them? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of approval of staff items A through G signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. We will take uh, about a 10 minute break and reconvene shortly thereafter. All right, we are ready to uh, reconvene. Next uh, on our agenda is the two-year community college committee meeting. Before we do, though, I'd like to say once again thanks to uh, Michael Ballard and his PBS group from KUSM in the uh, Bozeman campus for being here. We are streaming across the state, and uh, I think it, again, provides great access for people around Montana and around our campuses to uh, participate in at least partly participate in the board meetings. So thank you guys for being here. And Regent Hamilton. Thank you, Chairman Christian. We have four information items on our committee agenda. The first is the 12-month goals for the Deputy Commissioner for two-year in community college education. So actually, I'm just going to simplify things and turn all four items over to Deputy Commissioner Sec. <laughs> all right. Thank you, uh, Chairman Hamilton and uh, members of the board. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, to participate in uh, my first two-year in community college uh, committee as deputy commissioner. Um, the past uh, two months have been uh, extraordinary. I have uh, truly enjoyed the uh, opportunity to work with uh, Commissioner Stearns, work for Commissioner Stearns and work with my colleagues at OCHI, the two-year CEOs, and uh, colleagues at the university level across the state, as well as partner agencies at OPI, uh, Department of Labor and Industry, and others. I've been working uh, weekly with the uh, Lumina Education Foundation on the College Now initiative. Uh, in fact, uh, beginning with the Monday following uh, my appointment at the Board of Regents meeting at the University of Montana, began weekly meetings with Judy Hyman um, in working on the College Now initiative. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, opportunities that the uh, Lumina 
Education Foundation has afforded us and afforded me as the new guy on the block is the opportunity to fine tune the scope of work um, now that we are a year into the four year grant and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, beginning in December, I uh, began working uh, with the two year CEOs and uh, with Commissioner Stearns on my goals uh, for the first year as Deputy Commissioner and uh, the goals, uh, uh, Summer will punch those up uh, on your screen. I'd just like to, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'd just like to uh, um, highlight, highlight them for you. Um, one, of, uh, one of my major goals and something that I've been working on uh, since January 1 has been to work with the two-year uh, CEOs and conduct regular and frequent meetings in person and via telecommunications to really ensure that we're working as a highly functional team. Uh, we've, we've had four of those meetings since January 1, and they've been quite productive. Um, also, I'm working to engage and develop uh, relationships and partnership opportunities with the tribal colleges and have begun work on that process. As I mentioned, the College Now initiative has been taking a big chunk of my time and we've been uh, working to first of all assess uh, the baseline of uh, the work of where we are in College Now today, what we've accomplished and where we want to go. That's been a, a truly a collaborative effort working with uh, the two-year CEOs, the commissioner, as well as the colleagues at OCHI and with Lumina. And really working to invigorate, reinvigorate the work groups of College Now and, uh, and uh, direct them um, uh, based on uh, the refine, refinement that we uh, will do with respect to the scope of work. Um, a couple of other things that I've been working on is to schedule uh, site visits um, to each of the two-year campuses, uh, including uh, the Colleges of Technology, the Comprehensive Community Colleges, two-year programs at Western and Northern, and the Tribal Colleges. And so far, um, uh, I've uh, completed a visit to uh, the University of Montana, President Ingstrom, and um, Provost Brown and Dean Good have been very helpful there, and that also included a trip to Bitterroot College programs. I have a uh, trip scheduled to Flathead Valley Community College uh, this month and to Salish uh, Kootenai College also this month, and um, then uh, the next in uh, to MSU Great Falls uh, College of Technology. Uh, President Karras will uh, uh, visit with you uh, a bit later about a, a statewide effort that we've been working on to pursue our TAACCT U.S. Department of Labor funds, and uh, we will uh, share with you in a bit about what, what that involves. Um, as I mentioned, the work that we've been doing with, with the two-year leaders, we've really been focusing on um, the two-year mission and vision and um, looking at two-year education holistically across the state of Montana and coming together with a shared vision that really uh, makes sense. And uh, we'll be visiting about that in a few moments. And then the uh, Carl Perkins Initiative uh, has also taken a fair bit of my time working uh, uh, very closely with uh, Kathy Wilkins and our OPI colleagues um, and I will uh, provide you with a brief update on that. In fact, I'll, I'll do that now because that's the next item on the agenda. Um, in uh, June of 2010, Montana received a site visit from the U.S. Department of Education. Um, the Department of Education conducts periodic site visits of all states who have Carl Perkins initiatives. Um, we received our report uh, two weeks ago and included within this report are, of course, suggestions for improvement as well as a comprehensive summary where no findings were found. As you may know, Montana oversees about $5.8 million through uh, Carl D. Perkins with about 35% going to post-secondary institutions, 65% secondary institutions. As Deputy Commissioner, 
I oversee the grant, and I also chair the state executive leadership team, which is comprised of uh, uh, commissioner staff and OPI staff. We also have a state advisory team for Perkins, uh, which is comprised of uh, OCHI, OPI, adult ed, Department of Labor, the governor's staff, and community-based organizations. We will be having meetings of both of those advisory groups in the next three weeks. Over the next few weeks, I'll be working with the, the uh, state executive leadership team to develop um, our response to the Department of Education. I will keep uh, this committee updated through our chair, Regent Hamilton, and provide a future report to the uh, Board of Regents in May. Uh, before I leave Perkins, I'd just like to highlight a, a, a couple of key accomplishments for this past year because they're, they're truly extraordinary. Um, we have, uh, working with the Big Sky Pathways initiative, um, we have uh, conducted uh, over 600 and and created over 680 pathway templates uh, across Montana, which have been loaded into the Montana Career Information System. Uh, integral with this effort has been uh, the uh, development of uh, pathways and partnerships between secondary and post-secondary partners to increase uh, opportunities for secondary students um, to earn dual credit, as well as uh, to uh, engage in online offerings. These have been major achievements, and uh, we're very proud of them. We've also worked to develop curriculum guidelines for teachers uh, across the state on how to use the MCIS software. And uh, Montana Perkins has received a $1 million grant from uh, the Department of Education uh, to evaluate construction pathways and make recommendations for the integration of math and English instruction. Um, the uh, Montana Perkins indicator goals were achieved this past year, which enabled the state to, to participate and award incentive funds, which were used to collaboratively with OPI, Department of Labor and Industry, OCHI, and MCIS to implement PEP Talk a coordinated effort to help guide adults through MCIS, through career and educational exploration. We received an award from the governor's office for this work. Last year, all of Perkins' post-secondary goals and all but one of its secondary goals were met. And last year, we formed the uh, state advisory team. So I'm uh, very pleased with, with what's happened there, and I will keep you posted as we move forward. As I mentioned earlier, a major focus of our work since July, January 1 has been on the importance of developing a mission and vision statement for two-year education in the state of Montana. As you go back to August of uh, 2009, uh, this board, uh, passed resolution number two, which really, I think, set forth a, um, a directive for two-year education in Montana uh, to move, to adopt the comprehensive community college mission. But what we were lacking was a mission statement for two-year education across Montana, including the colleges of technology, the community colleges, and two-year programs at the universities. At our retreat on February 4th, um, Dean Bingham and Dean Schaefer uh, volunteered to uh, lead a work group um, to uh, work on the draft mission vision statement, which you have on the website. And at this point, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Dean Bingham and Dean Schaefer to uh, provide you with uh, an introduction to this process and what's happening now. Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, Dean Bingham is averting my eyes, which I'm taking to mean I should start this conversation. Um, thank you for the opportunity, as Deputy Commissioner Seck had mentioned. Uh, we were charged with pulling a group of individuals uh, from across two-year education, uh, broad terminology, two-year education, to 
help craft a, a mission and vision and perhaps a few steps further that uh, for two-year education as it exists within the state of Montana to provide perhaps some overarching context and direction uh, of where we aspire to be collectively. Uh, a few of the challenges that we faced almost immediately are things we think we struggle with continually and the fact that two-year education touches just about every type of institution in every corner in the state of Montana and therefore finding a, a shoe that fits all of those instances can be uh, incredibly difficult. Uh, we, we had some very robust and, and, and I think beneficial conversation that, that helped us grasp that and, and what you see before you is an overview or a suggested mission statement that we believe could be representative of two-year education regardless of where it exists, the tribal entities, the tribal colleges, uh, the embedded COTs, the standalone COTs, the community colleges, the four years with two-year college programs. Uh, we further had conversation to try to get at what we believed captured the, the definition or the mission of the, the comprehensive community college. Um, certainly in the state we know we have the, the three community colleges that are established uh, by, by the Constitution, uh, but also institutions that, that aspire to or currently already embrace what we'd consider the comprehensive community college mission. We, we attempted to tackle that by identifying what we called key attributes and, and purposes of, of these types of institutions, and you'll see that uh, on this document as well. It, it is a draft. Uh, I'll look to uh, President Karras to perhaps provide an update on how uh, the presidents of the community colleges are engaging their board in the conversation, and I know all of us uh, at the two-year institutions have been vetting this document with our, our executive teams and our, our faculty and staff. Uh, and I believe, uh, Deputy Commissioner Sec, correct me if I'm wrong, this is an initial stage. We're looking for broad feedback and, and really hoping that this document will stimulate conversation as much as provide us with an overview. President Karras, would you like to make a brief comment or Daniel? Chair Hamilton and members of the board, the community college boards are also, um, now that we have the draft, we'll be reviewing this and, and commenting. It's certainly a, a broad vision for all of two-year education in Montana. We appreciate the opportunity to be included in the conversation. If I might just add just one brief item to, to Joe's comments. Um, it's a draft, and we want, want you to remember it is a draft and that as the discussions go on, there's a good possibility that this may change a little bit. As we take a look at the standalones, the embeddeds, uh, working with tribal colleges and the community colleges, how, how this might come together for the state of Montana. What was really important to us is that we identify two-year education within the state of Montana and not be uh, exclusive of any organization, any college that is engaging in two-year types of education. And so that's what this is trying to do. And so as we discuss further and get into the strategies and how to uh, implement some of these strategies uh, that we've identified and have those robust discussions, there's a good chance some of this might change a little bit down the road. And that's a good lead-in uh, to our last item. Summer, if you could put the um, uh, flow chart on the screen. Um, and uh, as we've been working on the mission and vision and looking at our strategy one for College Now, and as you, as you may recall, strategy one for College Now is to implement the full comprehensive community college mission uh, at all to your colleges in the state of Montana. And as we've been uh, meeting uh, since uh, the 1st of January to discuss this, discuss the mission and vision, and the uh, remaining um, bit less than three years we have for college now, um, we really have uh, um, come to, an, I think, an agreement as a two-year uh, group to uh, uh, suggest that maybe for uh, strategy one of college now, we focus on um, bringing the comprehensive community college mission to the five COTs. Um, and this flowchart um, gives you um, a look at that and basically from, from the shared mission and vision, which we've been talking about, that would lead to essentially identifying the gap 
identifying the attributes of the comprehensive community college, of a comprehensive community college mission in Montana, and that's um, identified on the one-page draft mission, mission and vision document, which uh, uh, we just uh, uh, talked about. And then as a, the next phase would be to essentially conduct a, uh, a gap analysis and, and uh, in looking at the five colleges of technology, uh, um, where do they fit with respect to the attributes of a, of a comprehensive community college mission? And then the next, uh, the next step would be to uh, uh, develop uh, goals and strategies for addressing these gaps. Um, we would like to, we would propose to have that accomplished by July. Again, these are basic goals and strategies. Um, and then uh, the bulk of our work would be done um, between July and uh, fall of 2013, where we would uh, lay out strategies and timeline for each COT in Montana to achieve the comprehensive community college mission. And the final step, and as you know, Deputy Commissioner Mo has, has been talking about this uh, last several meetings, the ultimate name change of the uh, COTs. And um, we really can't re-image or re-brand the COTs if we don't uh, have them functioning and operating differently, like a comprehensive community college. So the last phase would really involve the imaging and implementation of the name change uh, for the five COTs, uh, and we're suggesting by September 2013. One of the things that, as we've been meeting, that, that's really important, I think, is, is the foundation of all of this are the guiding principles. And the guiding principles are to leverage the expertise from our three community colleges and tribal colleges to help with the change process, that the vision and mission we've been talking about is shared. The current governance models will not change, but the breadth and depth of programming will change to be reflective of the comprehensive community college mission and key attributes. And the key strategies will leverage partnerships, collaboration, and synergy with two-year programs at U of M Western, MSU Northern, and Montana's tribal colleges. And as Gallatin College programs and UM's Bitterroot College programs evolve, they may wish to choose to follow a similar process um, in adopting the comprehensive community college mission. Um, at this point, I'll pause and um, ask my colleagues if they have any brief comments they would like to make before we end our report and open it up. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Deputy Commissioner John Sack for his leadership in moving this forward. This, is, uh, this has been a really fun uh, um, ex uh, opportunity for us to engage in great conversation. It's, it's been good for two-year education, I believe, in the state of Montana to step back a little bit uh, from where we were and reevaluate where we want to go as, as a, um, a state in two-year education and, and involve everybody in that process. And I know that there are other strategies that uh, we still need to get to that were identified through the College Now Illumina grant. However, this strategy, strategy number one, is probably the most important for us and will give us the, uh, the tools that we'll need then to go by and develop and complete the other strategies. So I, I know that we're not completely there yet uh, on the other strategies, but this one right here, once we shake this one out, will give us the roadmap we need then at that point in time to finish out those strategies. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner uh, Sack. I'll uh, take those three items, I guess, as a, a total. I think we can see where they're all connected. And before we get to board questions, let me ask for comments from any of the other campuses. <coughs> President Hickswa. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I just wanted to reiterate what Daniel said. John has done a very, very nice job bringing us together as a group and facilitating 
us in a way that all of our voices have felt heard and that he has listened. And we're like herding cats sometimes. And so that is really a commendable accomplishment. Any other comments from the campuses? Any comments from faculty or students? I'll open it up to the board for questions or comments. Regent McLean. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the board, um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Sec, and uh, all of you who have done uh, such great work on, on moving the dial forward in this regard. It is certainly going to impact student learning across our state. Um, as we move forward on this, um, and Dr. Sex, specifically in regards to your, uh, on one of your goals, your creation of a statewide advisory board for two-year ed, um, I would ask that you um, look to uh, including a high school counselor as we move forward with the dialogue so that we can make sure that we are best prepared on our end, uh, K-12, to uh, deliver the two-year mission and be prepared to uh, make sure that our students are ready for that on-ramp. So thank you for the good work and I look forward to uh, more good reports. Any other questions or comments from the board? Regent Robinson. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I had a couple comments um, regarding the work, but before I do, I mean, I, I feel again when I heard this effort was taking place and, uh, and John was working on this, I thought what, what a perfect match because uh, nothing against all of you, but there's a lot of you <laughs> to have to pull together. So it's really commendable <laughs> to, to do that. I've been in a position like that and there's a lot of different ideas, but, um, but I, I commend John and I commend all of you for, for making time for this because this is important. Um, a couple of things when, when you talked about the next, some of the next steps, um, and, and one of them being the gap analysis is that I think I would suggest that included in that, because it's also part of looking at the gaps in the system, is what are the strengths and, and making note of those strengths too. Because I think sometimes we can focus on so much of what is missing or what we need to improve upon that that we forget to acknowledge those things that, that are the real foundation for what we can build on to at the same time. So I think it's something that hopefully can be included in that. Um, the other thing, and, and this is kind of a, a, a point of record that I'd, I'd like to make, especially this being my first Regents meeting, is that in, in working with tribal colleges, uh, we all understand the special relationship that we have in working with those independent colleges. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. We want to have those colleges as partners. And in every way, we want to work towards that. And I know you are and have been. Um, what I would suggest, and, and, it, and it's some of the subtleties, but they're important. Um, even in some of the description that I see, um, it shouldn't be Montana's tribal colleges as it shouldn't be Montana's universities when you list them all together. It really is, you know, tribal colleges as general, I would suggest, and listing them that way. Um, it's kind of a possessive thing. It's not Montana's tribal colleges. It's really each tribe's tribal college. And so where we can, uh, it would be good to acknowledge that uh, when we start to really work with them, reach out to them, and bring them to the table. Uh, I think it's, it's a point that is uh, just something that's in changing the culture of Montana and how we uh, uh, acknowledge all of the partnerships that we have out there to work with. So I would, I would suggest that. And, and I think as you, as you do that, you will find it's a different type of uh, approach. Um, and, and it's not an easy approach. I'll admit that, it's not an easy approach. Um, so, so if we can keep that in mind, though, I think it'll, it'll help us as we continue to build those relationships. Thank you. Thank you, excellent comments. Um, any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to the last item on the uh, information portion of our agenda, an update on a 
possible uh, Department of Labor competitive grant? Trade Adjustment Assistance Committee. <laughs> and President Karras uh, uh, and her team at Flathead have uh, agreed to take the leadership role for a statewide initiative. And uh, this grant is centered around uh, areas of, the, of any uh, area that has uh, experienced high numbers of layoffs, particularly with uh, uh, individuals who qualify for federal TAA funds. And the Flathead has uh, experienced the largest number of layoffs in, in the state. So they were a natural lead for this grant. So uh, I would like to uh, compliment President Karras and her team, uh, they have done an absolutely magnificent job leading this effort. Jane. Chair Hamilton, members of the board, uh, just a brief summary that Congress last spring passed $2 billion for community colleges to be awarded competitively through the, Depart the Federal Department of Labor, and $500 million this year will be awarded towards uh, communities that have, or states, that have trade adjustment assistance eligible workers and the, the focus of the grant is to provide support for overcoming barriers for those TAA workers to be able to achieve a successful education outcome and then move on into the workforce and to provide some partnerships with business and industry to create new jobs. The, Awards are a minimum of 2.5 million for each state and a maximum of 20 million with a few exceptions. Montana, as you heard from Deputy Commissioner Sec, is looking at a statewide grant. We have uh, visited with all of the public two-year, or colleges that offer two-year programs, as well as each of the individual tribal colleges and many of those institutions, I think almost every institution we've talked to in the state is interested in participating. So as you can imagine, pulling all those organizations together has been quite a, a large process. The focus of the statewide grant will be on one of the largest barriers for all of our trade adjustment assistance eligible workers and, and many of our other non-traditional and traditional age students, which is college math and the developmental math that they all need and how do we provide access to developmental math across the state to help those students be more successful as they move into college programs. So we'll be looking at some models that are already in existence in the state. How do we expand those? How do we provide the best opportunities for individuals in Montana to access the math, uh, basic math education that they need to be successful in college? Because as you all know, no matter what program you go into, whether it's a one-year certificate, a two-year associate's degree, a baccalaureate degree, or graduate program, there are very few, if any, I think, programs anymore that you can be successful in without having math skills. So that was one of the biggest barriers that we identified. We'll also be looking at providing some distance infrastructure to better serve individuals in outlying areas that can't easily travel so that we can provide better educational opportunities to those individuals. And another aspect of the grant is to enable us to create new programs or expand existing programs to meet the needs of the TAA workers. And of course, because of the way that the grant proposal is worded, it needs to focus on the TAA heavy areas. So we are looking at a number of areas across the state in which there are the most um, trade adjustment assistance affected workers, but we hope to be able to expand those programs across the state and to identify programs that are in, in existence in other areas of the state that we can then deliver through distance or through some partnerships to those areas that do have the TAA impacted workers. So the grant is due April 21st. It's quite a big project. We're working on it with everybody. I have to say each of the colleges that have been involved have been very supportive and, and helping us to move this forward as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions or comments from the campuses on this particular item? Faculty or students? Any comments from the board? Questions? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, 
I keep wanting to say Dean Sec, <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Commissioner Sec. It's going to take me a while to get through that. <laughs> um, the next item on our agenda is public comment on items not on this committee's agenda. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes the report of the two-year committee. <laughs> Thank you, Regent Hamilton. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is uh, taking action from yesterday's committee reports. We will start with the Administrative Budget and Oversight Committee, Regent Buchanan. Thanks, Chairman Christian, uh, board members. We have one action item uh, to vote on today, action item A. Uh, we heard about the property in Butte being donated to uh, Montana Tech via the foundation. Any discussion or questions among board members at this stage on this item? Public comment or comment from members of campuses or institutions? Seeing none, uh, it has been moved that we uh, move this forward for board approval. Mr. Chairman? Thank you. Uh, could we have a motion or are you moving? So moved. Okay. Uh, then we have a, a motion to uh, approve. Action item A and accept donated property uh, through Montana Tech. Um, is there any further comment from board members? Okay. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Regent Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the consent agenda, items A through D, uh, Request from any board members to it's been moved uh, from committee yesterday for a motion any request today for singling out any of those items by any members of the board Any comments or discussion from members of the board? Members of campus communities any comments or discussion? Seeing none mr. Chairman has been moved uh, to accept consent items a through D Okay, there's been a motion to approve uh, consent items a through D. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, favor signify by saying aye aye all those opposed? Motion carries. That concludes our administrative budget. Regent Barrett. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we obviously aren't taking any action on any of the information items, uh, but there wasn't much on TV last night, so I read through the uh, energy <laughs> update uh, <laughs> contract with performance with MSU and just wanted to make one comment we're, we're not doing it but they'll be coming back as I read through that and looked at the the work that was outlined all of which had certain energy saving and other objectives I guess I was struck by the fact that a significant amount of that work appeared to be things that with a little planning we could do with our own forces that is I mean literally changing light bulbs and light bulb fixtures and whatever and I'm just saying we should probably, before we go out and enter into a vast long-term contract, probably look within ourselves, consistent with our staffing and other things, but see how much of that we might be able to pull in-house. And I'm just saying that so it's considered before it comes back before us again. It, it, it's a very good point. I actually, I think Regent Hamilton, someone asked yesterday what one of the engineering bills totaled, and it was four or $500,000, and I was along similar lines thinking we have the some of the brightest people in the world already employed um, we have students looking for opportunities to learn uh, I wonder how many of those type of undertakings could happen in-house as well I know we all have uh, jobs to do but it, it, those things ultimately could be good learning experiences and save us a considerable amount of money Regent Barrett yeah I mean that Part of it was the point. We did pay for a study that was $500,000, and it is an excellent roadmap for what we need to do. So we now can maybe make a judgment how much of that can we act on ourselves. Yeah. We, we paid the price to get the roadmap. You know, so there are some things we won't be able to do with our own forces. And there's a boiler replacement in there that we're, you know, we're not going to do by ourselves. But there, a lot of them were pretty low-level, straightforward things that with a little planning we could, we could do probably within the scope of the people who are employed. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments before we leave that committee? All right. Then we'll move to uh, Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee, Regent Barrett. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we have one 
action item on our uh, agenda, which is the Associate of Science Nursing in Great Falls. Uh, the committee moved it forward uh, with a divided vote, uh, two to one but for approval, but obviously for more discussion uh, today. Uh, so I'll first ask if there are any, uh, is there any public comment on this particular item? Are there any comments from among the uh, uh, campuses or, or staff present relative to this item? Okay, then let's bring it back to the board. Is there a discussion among the board on this item? Reason Hamilton. Why don't, should we start with a motion and then we can... Okay, yeah, let's so just I'll, do I'll, I'll move approval of item A on the action agenda. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Barrett. Um, I'm not going to beat a dead horse here, I guess, but I do have a few comments I'd like to make. I think it's probably pretty clear how the vote might go on this. Um, but again, I'd like to bring in kind of a historical perspective. And I'd like to thank the campuses yesterday for the information that they provided in their comments. Uh, it's just a, another example of the collegiality that we have in the university system and the willingness to work together. Um, sometimes that means you're gallant and you throw down your cloak over the mud puddle so that somebody can walk over. Um, but, but there are numerous board policies and system governance papers that direct the system and the board to avoid unnecessary duplication of programs. I believe that the Great Falls program duplicates an existing program that, that has served the community for over 40 years and, has, and that program has modified its curriculum to accommodate the College of Technology LP and transfer students. That program has stated it has the capacity to accommodate additional students. Um, the existing program offers uh, new ASN graduates a seamless transition to the BSN completion program and that's the standard of professional practice that the Board of Nursing has encouraged us to pursue as educational institutions. Over the past 10 years, the system added new, four new ASN programs in Helena, Butte, Missoula, and Billings. Salish Kootenai College in Pablo added an ASN and a BSN program during the same period. Northern and Montana Tech developed BSN programs um, that are completion programs from their RN programs. Bozeman has um, extended their traditional BSN program to Kalispell and has received board approval for an accelerated second degree BSN program. The University of Great Falls recently started a BSN online completion program. And in addition to the two programs that were on our agenda for this meeting, uh, the campus academic projected proposals include an online ASN completion program from um, the University of Montana in Missoula and Gallatin College's uh, indication of their intent to offer an AAS RN program. So Montana will, on average, have given birth to 15 new nursing programs in a little more than a decade. I think we have the state pretty well covered right now, and I think that information we, sh we received at the last meeting showed that our programs are producing excellent nursing graduates for our, our clinical and um, other institutions around the state. Campus nursing programs are individually reviewed and accredited by both State Board of Nursing and the National League of Nursing. Because of the technical nature of the program, the mandated low faculty student ratio for clinicals, and the salary pressures we encounter when competing with the private sector for highly qualified faculty, nursing is one of the most expensive academic programs we have in the system. Every time we approve a new program, we increase administrative costs to the system in addition to those costs that are covered through reallocation on the campus. Even factoring in modest salaries for highly qual qualified program directors, minimum support staff, accreditation costs and at, at both the state and national level and, and minimal other expenses for travel and, and that type of thing. I did rough math and that's always dangerous with me, but I'm going to project that we probably have $100,000 in administrative costs associated with new programs when we approve them. 
I think that, as I said in the, in the committee conference call, there are efficiencies in growing a program rather than creating a new program. And if we look at the number of programs that we've created over the past 10 years and do the math, we're talking in the millions of dollars. Now, in a billion dollar budget, maybe that's not significant. But when we talk about our continual, continual propensity to duplicate programs, I think it might be. Northern has offered nursing education in Great Falls since the mid-1960s and in Lewistown since the mid to late 1980s. That program, offered in multiple sites, has a single nursing director, modest support staff, and faculty who live and work in the community serves. If we really believe that we need to control administrative costs and serve our communities in the state in alternate ways, we don't need to be duplicating programs. We need to be encouraging these campuses to work together. So with that, whatever the board's decision is, I'm certainly behind it, but I think we need to make it in a very conscious way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Is there any more discussion among the board? Regent Buchanan. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Regent Hamilton. Um, on the output side, uh, maybe Dean Schaefer, or whoever the right person asked this question of, uh, what are we seeing as far as trends in placement rates for graduates? I mean, I, four years ago, the demand was flying through the roof. Is that still the case? I mean, are we still seeing placement rates for the students increasing at the rate we saw four years ago? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Regent Buchanan, certainly uh, all, all sectors of the industry have had some impact by the recession, including health care. Uh, what I can tell you looking at our past trends and, and what I believe are the trends across the state that our nursing graduates are, are hired. Uh, almost immediately our LPN grads have been hired 100% um, as they move out and once we move out and as many of our partners in healthcare would say to use the recession as a way to gauge the, the future demand of nursing would be very, very short-sighted. Uh, the state could continue to produce maximum amount of nurses and with the projections for the state alone we would continue to need more nurses for the amount of vacancies both from uh, uh, turnover and new positions created. Thank you. Thank you. Any further uh, comment from among the board? Chancellor Trokey. Sorry to speak out of turn. Uh, Regent uh, Barrett, uh, Regent Buchanan, the placement rates for nursing is a little ambiguous because a person, a student can finish an ASN degree program satisfactorily, receive the degree, but once they, they have to sit for the licensing exam and that dictates whether or not an individual will finally be placed in the position that they've been trained for or not. So when we, when we look at placement for nurses, not only do we look for graduation rates, but we also have to look at percentage of passing the NCLEX to become a registered nurse. And that's a very, very important figure to, to keep in mind. And I'm glad to say that MSU Northern's graduates usually, in terms of every year or in the past few years, have hit either 100% passing of the NCLEX or pretty darn close to it, at least in the 90s first time around. That's, that's usually better than the bar. I guarantee it's better than the bar. Uh, I guess I have a question, just so I don't misunderstand in the future. I don't know what matters now, but when we use the term placement, I assume we mean getting a job in their career, which means that subsumes the passing the test. They've already done that and they've gotten, the, wouldn't that be what placement means? about yes and no. Uh, in many instances, we some students go on within a, a healthcare field, and we count that could be counting it as a placement if they were working in a hospital. Let's say continuing in their their LPN. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Any more discussion among the board? Okay, there's been a motion uh, to approve uh, action item. A, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Regent Barrett. Okay, we have a motion uh, before us to approve an associate of nursing at MSU Great Falls. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. I believe so. Motion carries. Uh, Regent Barrett. Here we have um, five consent items, uh, items A through. Regent Buchanan and Regent Hill. Two two. Uh, we have consent items A through E, which the uh, committee voted to, to move forward for approval. So I'll, I'll move approval of uh, consent items A through E, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Regent Barrett. Uh, there's a motion to approve uh, consent items A through E. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed? All right. I believe uh, that brings us to the conclusion of our academic research and student affairs. Indeed it does. Thank yes. you, Regent Barrett. Uh, we have done staff and comp, and if memory serves me, there is no two-year action items. Okay. Uh, so we're at that point uh, on the agenda then to call for public comment on any items not on the agenda. And I want to note precisely on time. Precisely on time. <laughs> any, any public comment on items not on today's agenda? Any public comment? Mr. Beck, I believe. Yes. I don't think that's on. Sorry. Is that on now? Uh, yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Dave Beck. I'm from the Missoula campus, and um, November was the first time I came to a trustees meeting. Um, I know I'm already missing protocol, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'll try and get the procedures down, and I'm not sure if I'm commenting at the appropriate time, um, but I'll make my comment anyway. Uh, I've been at the Missoula campus since the year 2000, and what I'd like to comment about is the, um, the discussion on benefits that was held earlier. And I'd like to preface my comments by saying that um, I really love my job. I think I have, I'm one of the luckiest people in the world, you know. I, the two things I love professionally are teaching and doing research and writing, and I get paid to do that, so who could be luckier? And living in Montana is a great place to live. I'm myself, I'm from Chicago, um, although my wife is a Montanan. She likes to refer to herself as a five or six hundredth generation Montanan. She's been, her family's been here a long time. Um, and I haven't, uh, but uh, we love living here. Uh, but um, when you talk about the, I, I've been in higher education for about 25 years. I worked at a um, private tribally controlled college before I came here, so I'm used to working with low pay and low benefits. Uh, and um, when you talk about the, the benefits, uh, I, I, I certainly appreciate having health care, and I certainly appreciate having retirement benefits, um, but for example, when you, um, this, this, the system does a good job of managing not to go in debt on the health care benefits, but when you do that, it comes at a cost to the employees. Um, so for example, in my case, and this is just anecdotal because it's just my case, but over the last three years, in addition to the couple of hundred dollars a month that it costs me to um, ab above what the state contributes for my family contribution, my average health care costs have been a little over $9,000 a year for the items that were permitted to report on the IRA. So that's a, that, that's a pretty high out-of-pocket cost. And <laughs> while the um, contributions that we make directly into the system aren't supposed to increase that much in the coming year. We've heard reports that our out-of-pocket costs may as much as quadruple in terms of 
what we'll be responsible for paying. So obviously that's a strong concern to um, many faculty members. Uh, and, and then in terms of the retirement plan on the TIAA CREF, um, again, I appreciate having a retirement plan, but we're, uh, so it's, we're, it's suggested to us that to improve our possibilities for retirement, uh, for having a good retirement package, that we contribute uh, out of our own pockets above and beyond what we already contribute to match, which would make sense, but of course things like the health care costs make that um, somewhat difficult. Even before the financial crisis occurred when I met with the representative of TIA Cref, he told me that if I worked till 70, uh, I could retire comfortably, and then nine months later I should go back to work uh, again. And I, it was somewhat tongue in cheek, but um, I mean, in some ways, I'm thinking of uh, not so much myself, I'm not trying to complain or whine or anything like that, but bringing in and, and retaining um, younger colleagues, and in some ways, my own family. I mean, is my best retirement plan to hope that when my wife gets a PhD, she gets offered a job out of state. Um, she's got a really strong connection to Montana, and so do my children and I. So just um, sorry for rambling, but I just wanted to kind of put a little bit of a um, context of what the numbers mean when you're balancing your side of the um, equation in terms of benefits and how it um, impacts uh, individual faculty members. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Professor Beck. Is there any other public comment? Or did you? No. Chairman Christian, thank you. I, since I opened the can of worms with all the questions, I, you know, part of the intent behind my questioning, uh, and maybe I failed to do that, is to illustrate that the you know, I'm getting a lot of comments from faculty members and members of the system related to these challenges. And, uh, you know, I haven't talked much about my situation, but our, our out-of-pocket's about to double in my family. I mean, these are, these are issues that are not limited to public employees. Uh, and to suggest that uh, any of the conversation was a shot at our uh, perception of value or anything like that is absolutely off the table and should be uh, not considered. But I'll, I'll say that, uh, you know, this issue that we're facing is not in my perspective, it's not limited to public employees, and it, it is my perception that, and I think it's important for us who are chosen to represent taxpayers to fairly represent that this is an issue we're facing as well, and uh, I am, when I reference other states and challenges that the country's facing, you know, I, I applaud our system for how responsibly we've managed this issue, uh, and it sounds to me like uh, the empl I appreciate David's comments very much, and to start off by saying how much he appreciates his job, and uh, that's such a different voice than we typically get in these discussions, and thank you very much for your commitment, and uh, from me very much, thank you for your continued commitment, and uh, I am by no means a stranger to the conversation. I'm in the business of trying to help people have that dialogue, and it's a challenging environment. We know it, and it is shared by your private sector colleagues, and uh, uh, we as a system, again, I applaud uh, Kevin and Connie and other members who have dealt with, you know, uh, balancing two very tough conversations. One, ability, and two, uh, our desire to uh, provide wages and, and benefits that are r cognizant of how much we are appreciative of the employer, employees of our system. So thank you for your comments, David. Thank you, Regent Buchanan. Any further comments? Any further public comment? Any public comment? All right, with that, we are adjourned. Whoa. <laughs> Apparently, we're not adjourned. <laughs> Commissioner Mom, Sturds. Mom, she, did, she did warn me, in fairness, I forgot. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I did ask just before we adjourned if we could have a quick review for the benefit of the board and those who attend meetings to, to look ahead. Um, I think most of the, in fact, I'm sure all, me all members of the board realize that our planning conversation for July 19th has been changed, but we don't, we're still polling you to find, if at all possible, a date that all seven of you can be present. So stay tuned on that. I just wanted everyone to know that it will not be July 19th. I don't, I think it'll be, either, you know, it'll be the, either the following week or the week after that, and we are doing our best. So, well, good job, Summer. 
put the red X through that. Um, and I wanted to call that to your attention. The, next, the two meetings after that are accurate. Uh, I'm not sure that we should impose again next January on the wonderful UM Helena College of Technology because we absolutely have to depend on them in odd numbered years. And I want to take this chance to thank them, as I'm sure you probably were about to also, Mr. Chair, for the terrific job Dean Bingham, you and all of your staff have done, including with the organization for the the legislative reception last night. I know that Doug Steele and Bill Johnston and Lynette and Summer and Winnie and all kinds of people and all these technical folks have just pitched in to make this very complex meeting um, so successful and so easy to work with and we are greatly appreciative. So I do think probably it's a one day me planning meeting in January 2012, that's what we usually have and it'll probably be at our office at so look for a few changes and remember, uh, members of the board, we bring back an updated version for you to approve, you know, about three years out at the May meeting. So with a, the, you know, we will fix any glitches or, or changes by checking them out with campus representatives prior to the May meeting. And it's just another preview. Um, you remember you have election of officers again at the May meeting for chair and, and to fill the vacant vice chair position at that time. So with that, now Mr. Chair, I think All we right. are getting close. Thank you. Dean Bingham, thank you. And thanks for everyone that participated in that uh, reception last night. It was actually, it was really, fun. It was, it was really cool. Uh, and the feedback uh, amongst all that participated, it, it's fun to see what it is we do outside of these meetings. So thank you all and we are adjourned.